This is Blake's Adventure, and I am going to rank every concert I have ever attended. I started this project back in 2019, but I am just now finishing it because I am dealing with health issues and I wanted to get this out there before I cease to this. Let's start with the worst concerts I've ever seen. First off is the reason I'm even making this video, 164. Broadside, the home team, and Honey Revenge at Numa, Seattle, Washington on April 28th, 2023. The worst show I have ever been to. I got hit in the head during the broadside set, and this led to me getting a concussion. Fast forward down the line, and I re injure my concussion. And fast forward to today, my concussion is slowly killing me. And I'm not joking either. This is the worst concert I've ever been to because it will be the reason I die. Coming in at 163, Lana Del Rey and Courtney Love at Sleep Country Amphitheater, Ridgefield, Washington, May 22, 2015. 40 degree weather at an outdoor venue, the worst opening act of all time. An insanely big name artist only playing for an hour, a terrible set list, no encore, and Lana stood in the same exact spot on the stage all concert long. Now one thing I forgot to mention is I may stumble over my words some, if I do, I'm just going to let it rock. I'm trying to do this in just one take, not trying to get it perfect. Um, and another thing is some of these venues, their names have changed over the years. Uh, for each concert, I have wrote the name of the venue that it was called at the time that I had seen the concert. Coming in at number 162, Sawyer, Drea, Maryland, and Zachary. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington. August 18th, 2018. People always complain about crowds talking during opening act, but have you ever heard a crowd talk loudly during the headliner? To start the show, the opening acts were very bad, and then comes Sawyer. Over half of the crowd was wearing Sawyer t-shirts, so why were they so noisy? They ruined the show. Coming in at 161, Modest Mouse and Brand New, Key Arena, Seattle, Washington, on July 30th, 2016. Modest Mouse was truly awful live. The singer was drunk and barely coherent in his words while the set list was bad. Brand new rocked it but also could have had a better set list. Modest Mouse's encore was seven songs long and almost made me miss my buzz back to my car and the encore didn't even include float on. Coming in at 160, we have Hunter Hayes, Josh Turner, Tyler Farr, Maddie and Tay, and Seth Venus. Showwear Center, Kent, Washington, on December 7th, 2016. How can a concert so stacked be so bad? Well, I went to this concert thinking it was a normal concert with each of these acts playing their own set. It turned out to be bad advertising by the Wolf Radio Station, and it was four headliners sitting on stage together, taking turns playing acoustic songs and only four songs each. Not worth the money and definitely not worth traveling to Kent for. I feel like I had a final the next day too. Now, the next set of concerts. I'm just here to be here. Jason Castro, Thunderground at GCU, Phoenix, Arizona, September 19, 2012. Free concert of a contestant I loved on American Idol. I wasn't familiar with much of his solo music and just went because it was free. Next, coming in at 158, Unspoken, at Canyon Hills Community Church in Bothell, Washington on August 15, 2018 with Liana and Brittany. The people made this concert better, but I was at the concert again because it was free to go to. I was unfamiliar with this work, and while it didn't sound bad, it wasn't something I walked away and decided to check out their studio. 157, Group 1 Crew, Thunderground at GCU, Phoenix, Arizona, December 3, 2012. As with the above concerts, I was there just because it was free and I wasn't too familiar with their music. 156. Chivalry is Dead, Always Right, Mahogany's Dixon, Straight Till Morning, Visions of the Martyr, To Each His Own, and Romance Mechanics. Pub Rock, Scottsdale AZ, September 13, 2013, with Lester and Matt AZ. Friends made the show good, but the music itself was whatever. I got a free ticket from my friend Lester in exchange for a drive to the show. And I remember some of the opening acts being okay, but I did not like the headliner at all. Coming in at 155, 
Lecrae, Trip Lee, KB, Tadashi, and Pro. GCU Arena, Phoenix, Arizona, November 2nd, 2012, with Mary and Andrew. Friends made this show again, but the only reason I went is because of friends. Back in junior high and to a lesser extent high school, I used to listen to Lecrae, but by college he had phased out of my music list. I wasn't familiar with the opening acts other than their names and maybe one or two songs. I don't remember much from this show. Now we have the wasn't worth it affected by outside factors category. 154. Get Dead, Mass Intruder, Anti-Flag, and Less Than Jake. Denial, Mesa, Arizona, December 3rd, 2013. This is a concert I just want to forget for reasons I won't specify, but Less Than Jake rocked it. 153. Run to cover the Medic Droid, Dynasty 3, Get Loud, Divided Minds. Joe's Grotto, Scottsdale, Arizona, January 21st, 2016, with Max. Run to cover wasn't the headliner, but they were the second to last play and they were the reason we went. If I remember right, even being the second to last band to play, their set was insanely short. I'm not sure it was worth waiting through all the average or below average opening acts to watch Run to cover. My friend and I left after Run to cover one of the few times I've left a concert early. 152. Incubus, Jimmy World, and Judah and the Lion. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, August 19th, 2018. While I think Jimmy Eat World and Incubus could have had better set list, both bands sounded good live. My issue with this show is that I befriended the couple next to me during Jimmy Eat World, but during Incubus, the couple got into a huge fight and were just arguing over the music the entire time. People can easily ruin a show. Coming in at 151, we have Rogue Wave and Hib. Hib Do, Wild Buffalo House of Music, Bellingham, Washington, June 23rd, 2016. Do you ever go to a concert that's far away and wonder the day of the show why you decided to go to the show? It was a long drive home that night. The Rogue Wave set list needed mad work as they ignored my favorite album from them. The venue needed better sound quality. Both bands were good otherwise, but it could have been better since I drove a couple hours for it. Coming in at 150, Matt and Kim and No Parents. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, November 2nd, 2019. Matt and Kim are one of my favorite bands of all time, but their live show is definitely a miss. For one, I'm not a fan of the sexual content, and they happen to make their non-sexual songs sexual with a bunch of crude props and jokes. I was not a fan. 149. The Wonder Years, Origami Angel, Save Face, and Spanish Love Song. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, February 6, 2022. I was at the show only for Spanish love songs and they had such a short set. They also rushed song and song and even felt like they played sped up versions of their songs. I was a bit disappointed with this show. Now we go to the good. Dire Fire record release show. Dire Fire, Bleed the Stone, Dead Electric, and Static. The Live Room. Sumner, Washington, January 2nd, 2016. Dire Fire is my friend Caleb's band, and it was cool getting to support the release of their first album. 147. Elevation Worship, Climate Pledge Arena, Seattle, Washington, October 30th, 2022, with various friends. Part of the reason this concert ranks so low is I don't remember anything about it. All I remember is going with the show to friends, and I remember enjoying myself. 146, Walker Hayes and Parmalee, Angel of the Winds Arena, Everett, Washington, November 12, 2023. One of the shows I look back on and wonder why I went to this show. I'm not even super into Walker Hayes like that, but I did enjoy myself. I remember having a good time at the show. 145, The Who and Liam Gallagher, T-Mobile Park, Seattle, Washington, October 19, 2019. There's nothing wrong with this show, but nothing spectacular about this show either. It was great to finally see the Who, but they were definitely past their prime. 144. Pete Yorn, Neptune Theater, Seattle, Washington, October 15, 2019. I was going to write a story of how I discovered Pete Yorn and how God used his song, Lose Yourself, three years later in my life. Unfortunately, Pete Yorn has no set list and he plays whatever he feels like each night and it didn't get played. Neither did his most popular song get played. It was still a great show, and I will have to see him again.
143, Panic at a Disco, Arizona, and Haley Kayoko. Serena, Seattle, Washington, August 10th, 2018. Do you ever go to a show for an opening act only, but stay for the headliner because you like a few songs? It was a good show, but because I'm not the biggest Panic fan in the world, it falls low on this list. 142, Pup, Joyce Manor, and Pool Kids. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington. March 15th, 2023. This show was a typical pop punk slash punk show that was enjoyable, but nothing crazy to write home about. I enjoyed seeing all three bands. 141. Thousand Foot Crutch, Thunderground at GCU, Phoenix, Arizona, August 27th, 2012, with Ashley and Andrew. This is another case of a band I saw after I'd already stopped listening, listening to them. They played well, and friends made the show better. 140. Vance Joy and Jack Botts, Paramount Theater, Seattle, Washington, March 4th, 2023. This is another show I don't remember very well, which is probably why it's higher on my list. This is my second time seeing Vance Joy and my first time seeing Vance Joy headline. I remember having a good time. Deck the Hall Ball 2017. Pillars, The Luminaires, and Odessa. Key Arena, Seattle, Washington, December 5th, 2019. Due to work, I missed half of Deck the Hall Ball, but I managed to see the three artists I care about. The Killers and Luminaires put on great sets. 138. Imagine Dragons, The Naked and the Famous, and Nico Vega. U.S. Airways Center, Phoenix, Arizona, February 17th, 2014. Just like the Less Than Jake concert, this concert is one I want to forget for outside reasons. Ignoring those outside factors, the actual show put on was really good. Seeing the Naked and Famous for the first time was incredible, and seeing Imagine Dragons for the second time, back when they were still a good band, was a great combination. 137. Simple Plan, Neptune Theater, Seattle, Washington, September 2nd, 2017, with Matt C. For some reason, I don't remember much about this show. I do remember they played their entire album, their entire first album in full, which is actually my least favorite Simple Plan album. But I finally got to see them live for the first time, which was incredible. Hand in the Grass 2017, Horn, Stone Sour, Baby Metal, The Pretty Reckless, Yellow Wolf, Rad Key, Islander, and 10 Miles Wide. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, July 24th, 2017, with Matt C. Festivals are weird because they have a higher chance to be the best shows you've ever seen, but also have a high chance of being the worst shows you've ever seen. Due to a long day and a large concentration of lineup, it can end up positive or negative. Venue, weather, surrounding people, and more play a role. Personally, I only cared about Corn Stone Sour, Baby Metal, and to a lesser extent, Yellow Wolf when it came to this lineup. I got yelled at by people behind me for standing and enjoying myself at the concert. Corn and Stone Sour played well, but could have had better set lists. It was nice to, to get to cross off list of ass never seen before, as well as see the new sensation in Baby Metal. Overall, good show, even with the negative. Coming in at 135, Plain White Tees, Armors, Say We Can Fly, and A Summer High. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, November 2nd, 2018. If you have heard me talk about concerts before, then you know that I can be highly critical of set lists when it comes to bands playing their entirety of their new album or when they don't have diversity in set lists. It was cool to finally see Plain White Tees after listening to them for 12 years, but the set list could have been better. 134, Total Line and Ocean Park Standoff. Neptune Theater, Seattle, Washington, November 20th, 2018. One of the few shows where I came into it knowing nothing about the opening act, but walked away a fan of the opening act. Both bands put on a fantastic show with really good set lists. They played at a venue I really enjoyed, and the only reason this concert finds itself not very high on this list is because I don't like Codaline nearly as much as a lot of other artists on 133. Palfew, Cody Lawless, and Joni. Newell, Seattle, Washington, March 1st, 2024. I finally got to see my favorite rapper of all time. The set list and performance was incredible. The reason this concert is so high up is that I'm basically on my deathbed at this point. I could barely breathe and stand during the concert and felt awful the entire time. Palfew rocked it though, and Joni had an amazing set as well. 132. Pale Waves, Kaylee Morg, 
and the Condescence, Numo, Seattle, Washington, November 30th, 2018. One of the rare cases where I went for an opening act. I was familiar with Pale Waves due to seeing them open for the 1975, but I only listened to Kaylee Morgan. Both Kaylee Morgan and Pale Waves put on really good shows and got me to check out Pale Waves music after this show. I was familiar with Paranoid's music during this show. This concert would rank higher. 131. The Postal Service and Yah. America Theater, Phoenix, Arizona, April 18, 2013. Novelty of this concert was one in a lifetime chance to see. Postal Service on a 10 year anniversary tour for their only released album. If you didn't catch this tour, you likely missed out for good. That turned out not to be true. <laughs> The show was good, but I did not like the venue so much that I've never been back to the to this venue to this day. One third, Hillsong United, Showwear Center, Camp Washington, June 6, 2013, with Matt C. Two and Kenny. It was basically a gigantic worship service. Seeing and feeling the presence of God moving in people around me was absolutely incredible. Seeing people on fire for Jesus was absolutely amazing. Can definitely tell that God moved in people's lives during this concert. Hearing it all day live was like 129. A day to remember the used movements in Magnolia Park. Walmart Theater, Seattle, Washington, October 11th, 2022. A day to remember the used movements. Got to see three bands I really enjoyed. Such a stacked lineup. Movements in the used had incredible set lists and rocked the house down. The day to remember Settlers could have been slightly better, but they put on an energetic and great sounding performance. Had a great time at the show and I'm happy I went. Also got to see Magnolia Park for the first time. Coming in at 128, Blake Shelton, The Band Perry, Dan and Shay, and Neil McCoy. AK Chin Pavilion, Phoenix, Arizona, September 5th, 2014. Being a fan of both Blake Shelton and Dan and Shay, I was super excited for this concert. Both of them delivered like I was expecting them to. Great sets from both the artists at a venue I like. 127. Sam Smith and Gavin Jones. Jobbing.com Arena, Glendale, Arizona, September 30th, 2015. Sam Smith has an amazing voice and he puts on a great show. I remember he sounded better than Studio Live, but I don't remember much about the actual production of this show. 126. Maverick City Music, Climate Pledge Arena, Seattle, Washington, July 19th, 2022, with various friends. Saw Maverick City Music with some great friends, got to walk around Seattle and meet with three friends, then joined up with more friends to see Maverick City Music play live. I had zero idea what to expect going into this show, but they definitely know how to put on a show. They have so much passion for the Lord and also so much energy when performing. They also performed for two and a half hours. The longest set I've seen one band or artist ever perform, surpassing the first time I saw Kenny Chesney when he played for two hours. I'm sore, but it was worth it. 125. Manchester Orchestra, Michigander, and Foxy. The Moore Theater, Seattle, Washington, February 23rd, 2022. Manchester Orchestra was absolutely insane live. They sounded just as good, if not better, than studio. They have so much energy and they put together a pretty good set list. They even closed this set out with my favorite song of the, the Silence, which apparently they haven't played on the tour yet, but they whipped it out just for us tonight. Insane show. Also saw Foxing and Michigander, Michigander, who were good as well. 124, Empire, Empire, Free Throw, Cave Sounds, and Glencoe. The Underground, Mesa, Arizona, October 13th, 2014 with Matt, AZ, and Preston. Seeing Free Throw was a dream come true and they had a perfect set list. They sounded better than studio and it was one of my favorite sets ever. I was also at the very front for their set. The show would be higher if in the list if Free Throw were the headliners or if I cared about the other three bands. 123, The Amity Affliction, Being as an Ocean, Trophy Eyes, Hundreds, and Dead Ships. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, October 15th, 2016 with Matt C. As far as I remember, this was my first time seeing every band on this lineup, and let me tell you, that lineup is stacked. It was extra enjoyable because my friend Matt is a huge Amity Affliction fan, so it was cool to rock out to the show. Amity, Being as an Ocean, and Trophy Eyes all had fantastic set lists and all sounded at least as good as their studio work. The only downfall to the show is I believe I was a little sick. 
122. Trophy wise, run to cover, curses, Roman citizen, and Stephen Curry's. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, September 3rd, 2016, with Gabrielle. The show was cool because I got to see Run to Cover for the third time, and Run to Cover is a band who I absolutely love. They put on a stellar live show and great at doing covers as well. My friend's band, Roman Citizen, was there as well, and it was cool getting to support them. 121. The world is a beautiful place, and I am no longer afraid to die. World's Greatest Dead and Dream Well. Numos, Seattle, Washington, April 28, 2023. The show would be higher if I didn't just get hit in the head the day before the show. I enjoyed this show and it was amazing to finally see the world is a beautiful place and I'm no longer afraid to die. But I could have enjoyed it more if I could have bounced around. 120. Moose Blood, Lydia, and Souvenirs. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, April 7, 2018. It serves to be a hipster opinion, but El Corazon is my least favorite Seattle venue, and I dread every time I have to go to the venue. This concert was great, but it lost a lot of touch when McCafferty dropped off the tour before the Seattle date. I do not blame McCafferty for dropping off the tour, but I was excited to see one of my favorite bands ever. I'm having trouble remembering how the other opening acts to this show perform, but I do remember going home and checking out Lydia's music afterwards. Loose Blood was fantastic as always, and this show would have been higher up if moves. Moose Blood's third album was better, and McCaffrey showed up. 119. Thomas Rhett and Dustin Lynch, Tacoma Dome, Tacoma, Washington, May 18th, 2019. The Tacoma Dome is one of my least favorite venues, but I will go when I have to. I honestly don't remember much from this concert, but I do remember Thomas Rhett putting on a great set like always. 118. Thomas Rhett, Connor Smith, and Parker McCall. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, August 18th, 2020. For some reason, I don't remember much about Thomas Rhett's concert. This is another show of his where I remember enjoying the show and enjoying the set list, but I don't remember much. 117. Of Monsters and Men, Wamu Theater, Seattle, Washington, September 26, 2019. I don't remember too much about this show, which is likely why it's not higher. I remember of Monsters and Men sounding just as good as the studio versions, and having a great set. 116. Neck Deep, Boston Manor, 0936, and Heart Attack Man. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, November 17, 2021. This was a period in time where Neck Deep had just released a very mediocre album, so I wasn't expecting the show to be as good as the other times I had seen. The main reason I went to see I went was to see Boston Manor, and Boston Manor sure didn't disappoint. 115. Wage War, Nothing Nowhere, and Spike. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, April 26, 2023. I was mainly there for Nothing Nowhere, and concerts are often not as good when you aren't there for the headliner. I still have a great time and remember enjoying all three sets. Nothing Nowhere was incredible to see. He sounded just as good as the studio versions live, and the set list was incredible. 114. Dirk Spentley, Randy Hauser, Cam, and Tucker Bethard. Play Country Amphitheater, Ridgefield, Washington, September 15, 2016. One of the drawbacks of a concert being at Ridgefield is that you have to drive two hours and 30 minutes to a venue that has nothing else around it but a lonely gas station. A lot of the country concerts are played at this venue for whatever reason. When it came to this lineup, I was interested in the headliner Dirk Bentley as well as Cam. Every time I drive to Ridgefield, I wonder if it's worth it, even if the concert was good. I had lawn seats and the couple next to me left before the first opening act, even finished, and another group in the distance got kicked out before the first act was finished. It had a weird atmosphere to it, but I was happy to finally see Cam, who put on a great show. I was happy to see Dirk Spentley for the second time. His cellist was great, and he nailed his vocals as always. 113. Bring Me the Horizon, Under Oath, Under Oath and Bear Tooth. Walmart Theater, Seattle, Washington, April 1st, 2017. Another good show, but the reason it falls lower than a lot of shows is because only from Bring Me The Horizon has messed up his vocal cords, making the live performance subpar at times, and it feels like it gets worse every year. The setlist also suffers from this fate, but overall they still put on a good show and entertain you. Bear Tooth is insane live, and I was stoked to get to see them again, and they definitely delivered. I'm not a fan of Under Oath, and I did not enjoy their performance.
112, Maddie and Tay and Dylan Jacobson. Auburn Performing Arts Center, Auburn, Washington, May 6, 2017. This concert was really good because I was super excited to see a Maddie and Tay headline show for the first time. It was the only time I've been to this venue and I quite enjoyed the venue, the people around me, and the live music. The show falls so low on the list simply because the set list was a lot of unreleased songs which made it so I just had to sit slash stand and listen. There's nothing wrong with just sitting and listening, but shows where you can sing your heart out for the entire show are the best show. 111. Angels and Airwaves, The New Regime, and Charming Lives. Rosalind Theater, Portland, Oregon, September 20th, 2019. The reason this show is so low is because I had just seen the same show the night before in Seattle. Later on the list, you'll see just how good this show is. This was a show I had really enjoyed. Angels and Airwaves sounded amazing and had an amazing set. 110. Kenny Hoopla, Chop Suey, Seattle, Washington, March 11, 2022. Kenny Hoopla definitely knows how to put on a show and gave it his all on stage. The set list was great, the performance was great, and it was an experience to hear some of my favorite songs live, although I don't remember too much about the show. 109. The Amity Affliction, Silverstein, Holding Absence, and Unity, Texas. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, August 31st, 2022. I got to see The Amity Affliction, Silverstein, Holding Absence, and Unity, Texas. The show is absolutely incredible. A huge shout out to Silverstein for letting a wheel spinner decide part of the set list. First time I've ever seen something like this. Now, this was my fourth time seeing The Amity Affliction and my second time seeing Silverstein. Every time both of these bands play, they perform incredibly well and make it a hype show to watch. I believe it was my first time seeing both the opening acts, and honestly, I was impressed by the openers, which often is a great night. 108. Twin 92, Chelsea Cutler, and Ty Vernis. Wamu Theater, Seattle, Washington, October 10th, 2021. This was the only time where Chelsea Cutler was not the headliner when I saw her, and I mainly went to the show for Chelsea Cutler. All three artists sounded amazing, but I wish Chelsea got to play for longer and also had a better set list. Still a solid show that I enjoyed. 107, The Gaslight Anthem and Tiger's Jaw. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, September 14, 2022, with Tim. As much as I love the Gaslight Anthem, they spent way too much time of their set talking. They could probably fit four more songs in the time they spent talking. But when they do play, they sound amazing. It was also my first time seeing Tiger's Jaw, who I also love, and they played amazing as well. 106, Real Friends Have Mercy, Tiny Moving Parts, Broadside, Nothing Nowhere. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, May 7, 2017. I've seen Real Friends a lot of times, and this is the only show of theirs that you will see this low. At the time, I didn't know who Nothing Nowhere was and wasn't regularly listening to Broadside. I like both of them a lot now, but at the time of the show, I was dreading sitting through four acts I did not care about just to see Real Friends again. This is why I prefer three band buildings unless the lineup is absolutely stacked. Real Friends had a great set list and put on a good show, but there was times I was wondering why I came to the show. I'm not the biggest fan of El Corazon either, but I'm a huge fan of Real Friends. I think they might be a favorite modern band, so just seeing them again made the concert good. 105, Never Shout Never, Metro Station, Jewel, Vera, Water Parks, and Never Let This Go. The Marquee, Tempe, Arizona, January 19th, 2016, with Sophie and Cara. Never Shout Never didn't play their best song. Zero out of ten. Kidding, of course. Never Shout Never put on a good show. I finally got to see Metro Station live. That was a dream of mine, and I actually got to check it off the list. Water Parks was a band I was unfamiliar with at the time, but I left the concert a fan of them. Good show. 104. Train, The Fray, and Matt Nathanson. The Gorge, Quincy, Wa Washington, July 25th, 2015. Was this show with this much star power doing so low? Well, I'm not the tallest guy in the world, and I was behind people taller than me. On top of that, I don't actively listen to Train, but I know some of their music. I mainly went for The Fray, and while they put on a good show, I wish they played longer than now. Train and Matt Nathanson also played. 103. Breaking Benjamin, Chevelle, Three Days Grace, and Dorothy. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, September 22nd, 2019, with Matt C. The show would be higher if Adam was still with Three Days Grace. Three Days Grace is not the same with the new singer. 
It's one of those bands that you could not replace the singer. It was my first time seeing Chevelle, and it was great to finally see them, but they sounded way worse than the studio version of themselves, which is a damper when a band doesn't sound as good live. I still enjoyed my time watching them and watching Breaking Benjamin again. 102. Deck the Hall Ball 2019. The 1975, The Head in the Heart, The Regrets, Catfish in the Bottleman, Of Monsters and Men, and Chong the Nomad. Wamu Theater, Seattle, Washington, December 10th, 2019. Deck the Hall Ball 2019 had an absolutely stacked lineup. I saw the 1975 and Of Monsters and Men for the second time each. Finally got to see the Head of the Heart and Catfish in the Bottom and while being blessed with good sounding opening act, The Regrets. I'm glad I went. The 1975 had the best performance and stage presence. But I think Tired and First Free, best set list with Catfish and Monsters. Great stuff. 101. Wallows and Spill Tab. Paramount Theater, Seattle, Washington, April 1st, 2022. Wallows put on an insane show. Wallows has a lot of energy live. They sound just as good, if not better, than the studio versions live. It was crazy to hear Dylan and Braden sing live in person. The setlist was amazing, too. I wasn't sure how I would like the setlist because the new album just came out a week before the show. So I wasn't sure if they would skip out on the classics. I wanted to hear him play too many new album songs, as I usually like a bounce. But it turned out to be a good set list. I hadn't had much time with the new album, but they played all four of the songs that really stood out to me from the new album so far. So that was cool to hear. Walls are also really cool people because they stopped to take care of crowd members who wanted out of the pit section mid-set. Classy act. Definitely recommend seeing Walls live sometime. 100. AJR and Boy With Youth. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, June 14th, 2022. It was my second time seeing AJR, and I find it cool how virtually the entire show was different from the first time, but the energy, cool visuals, and performance were still just as good as ever. By far one of the best live bands out there. Boy With Youth was the opener, and I actually really enjoyed him. He definitely gained a new fan. 99. Dirk Spentling. Washington State Fair, Puyallup, Washington, September 15th, 2022. It was my third time seeing him, and he always puts on an amazing show. He has some of the best energies and vocals of any live performer I have ever seen, and his set lists are always amazing. It's interesting how I always have to travel to a venue I rarely go to every time I've seen him, but I'm okay with that because it's worth it. Incredible night. 98. Sleeping with Sirens, Don Broco, Point North, and Garzy. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, August 10th, 2022. My head hurt and I didn't get to eat dinner because the cook didn't arrive until doors, but the concert was still insanely fun. I got to see both Don Broco and Sleeping with Sirens for the fourth time each. Got to pick up the best piece of merch I've ever seen in a Don Broco basketball jersey and got to rock out like crazy to my favorite songs. Don Broco and Sleeping with Sirens were both amazing live. I wish Sleeping with Sirens had a better set list, but I can't complain too much because every song sounded incredible anyways. Don Broco had an amazing set list and they always blow me away when I see them. A huge shout out to the opening acts too, they both surprised me heavy. I knew who Point North was, but never really decided to check them out. Now I will have to check them out. First time hearing of Garzy, but I definitely became a fan. 97. Chelsea Cutler and Anthony... Russo, Crescent Ballroom, Phoenix, Arizona, March 28th, 2019. Ranking this show is hard because I'm biased at Chelsea Cutler. She's my new favorite artist by far. Chelsea Cutler came on stage and said that she had lost her voice and you could tell that her voice was shot, but she still powered through and played the show. She dropped two songs from her set list, one which was unreleased at the time, and that is understandable. I think from an enjoyment perspective, this show is up there. But in terms of, in terms of fun, but that's the bias in me talking. I feel like I can't have this concert much higher because of how the vocals work. Ninety six. Chris Young and Cassidy Pope, Washington State Fairgrounds, Puyallup, Washington, September nineteenth, twenty sixteen. Being a fan of Chris Young's radio hits, I was largely unfamiliar with his studio work. This is one of the concerts where I went to for the opening act, Cassidy Pope. Cassidy has been a celebrity crush of mine since 2008, and I finally got to see her live. She was even better live than in studio. 
I almost had the chance to meet her as well, and if I met her, the show would probably be even higher. I was in line to meet her, but didn't get up to her in time, and it still makes me sad to this day. Chris Young put on a stellar show and played all my favorite songs of his, as well as some songs I was unfamiliar with, but even those songs sounded good. Honestly, I still haven't checked out his full albums to this date, and I don't know why, because everything I hear from him is... 95. Escape the Fate, A Skylight Drive, Sworn In, Sirens and Sailors, Michael Relocate. Joe's Grotto, Scottsdale, Phoenix, Arizona, November 11, 2015, with Matt AZ. This was my first time seeing Escape the Fate and A Skylight Drive. Growing up as huge fans of both bands, the lineup was super exciting for me. I feel like all fans on the lineup at least put up a serviceable set. Despite Joe's, Joe's Grotto being the worst venue I've ever been to, the concert was just a solid showing all the way through. 94. Christmas Chaos 2015. Asking Alexandria, I Set to Kill, Whitney Payton, The Family Ruin, Run to Cover, Dead, Crisis and Victory, Ella K, and Note to Self. Live Wire, Scottsdale, Arizona, December 2nd, 2015. Let me start off by saying that I had to sit through a lot of average at best opening acts to see the two bands I came for. But the reason this show isn't lower on the list is because of falling in love with one of the opening acts, Run to Cover. I have seen Run to Cover three times now, but this was the first time I saw Run to Cover. And before the show, I had no idea who they were, and they blew me away so much that I bought their CD from the merch table. The reason I came to the show was for Asking Alexandria and I Set to Kill. This was the first Asking Alexandria show with the original Screamer back in the lineup, so it was a treat to see how the show would go down. This was my first time seeing I Set to Kill as well, and they put on a great show. It was nice to finally see both bands after growing up with them. 93. Kendrick Lamar, Travis Scott, and D-Ran. Tacoma Dome, Tacoma, Washington, August 2017. I had a list of every concert I had attended, but then I remembered the show and noticed it wasn't on the list. I'm not entirely sure how much that fact affected this placement of this show. I am not the biggest fan of the Tacoma Dome. The opening acts were underwhelming and Kendrick was good. Travis Scott only performed verses from songs instead of full songs and it got under my skin a lot. I've only been to two major rap shows in my life. That's not true anymore. So I'm not sure if it, that's normal or not, but I sure hope it isn't. And I'm glad I don't go to more rap shows. Kendrick's set list and production was great. His vocals could have been slightly better, however. Also, DRAM was downright awful. 92. Tessa Violet, Desorme, Will Joseph Cook. The Crocodile, Seattle, Washington, August 30th, 2022. This was my first time seeing Tessa Violet headline. Her setlist was incredible. Her vocals sounded just as good as the studio versions, and she had very good onstage charisma. I don't remember anything about the opening acts, but I do remember enjoying the show a lot. 91. Rise Against, AFI, and Anti-Flag. Wamu Theater, Seattle, Washington, September 24th, 2018, with Matt C. This was my second time seeing all three bands on the bill, and I have nothing bad to say about this show. Rise Against had a really good set list, which I was surprised by for being 2018. AFI had a good set list as well. All three bands sounded good, and I had a friend with them. 90. Haley Kayoko and Jez Kent, The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, April 19, 2018. As it often is with pop shows, I don't know the opening act of the show. It's easier for me, personally, to have a show Ray Iyer when I like and know more than one act on the bill. Haley, Haley Kayoko has a fantastic set list, and she played at my favorite venue, all while sounding better than the studio versions of her songs live. But there is more to the show than just one hour of enjoyment I would have ring Iyer. 89. I Prevail, We Came as Romans, The Word Alive, and Escape the Fate. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, September 29, 2017, with Matt C. I've been falling away from We Came as Romans years ago and only think I Prevail's album was average. I wasn't sure what to expect from this show. I came to the show mainly for Escape the Fate and The Word Alive, while my friend had mainly came to the show for I Prevail and We Came as Romans. I figured the show would be good, but it had a chance of being subpar. In the end, I actually enjoyed the sets from all four bands. I wouldn't say I was wowed by any set, but they all put on a solid show. This is purely based on music perspective because this show caused me some health issues and led to 
unnecessary bills and every time I wear the Word Alive t-shirt, I think about how they end up ruining five months of my life. 88. The story so far, Joyce Manor, Mom Jeans, and Microwave. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, May 11, 2020. I saw one of the most stacked concert lineups ever. I was dead tired during the show and a Red Bull didn't seem to wake me up, but I still had a fun time. Can't believe I got to see the story so far, Joyce Manor, Mom Jeans, and Microwave in the same lineup. I'm a pretty bit I'm a crazy big Mom Jeans fan, as well as a fan of the rest of the three. All four bands sounded great and had great sound. Got to hear Mom Jeans, Joyce Manor, and the story so far play my favorite song of theirs. 87. Emery, the classic kind, the classic crime, and Kuroshi. Numo, Seattle, Washington, April 2nd, 2023. One of the best concerts I ever went to. Emery is amazing. The set list was fire. They sounded incredible live, especially for being in their 40s. And it was also an extra good show for other reasons. 86. Dan and Shay and Chris Lane. Paramount, Seattle, Washington, April 12th, 2019. The show was really good. The only complaints I had were arbitrary, with me being short, feeling out of place, and the fact that the set list could have been better in my opinion. I was only familiar with a few of Chris Lane's songs, but he sounded great on stage, even when I couldn't sing along to the words. Dan and Shay put on a fantastic show. They had great stage production, as well as great charisma on stage, and the vocals were on point. I was very happy I was finally able to see Dan and Shay headline after, not, after being not let in the last time. 85. Angels and Airwaves and Bad Sons. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, October 3rd, 2020, with David and Dan. Unlike the first two times I saw Angels and Airways, I don't remember too much about this show. I just remember seeing a great set with, with some friends. Tom DeLong sounded incredible as always. 84. Mesa Meltdown, Night 2. Bring Me the Horizon, Issues, and Pairs. Mesa Amphitheater, Mesa, Arizona, October 22nd, 2015. While I think this lineup was worse compared to the second time I saw Bring Me the Horizon. I definitely believe the setlist and vocals from Bring Me the Horizon were way better. I was front row for this show as well, where I was all the way in the back the second time I saw Bring Me the Horizon. Issues was a fantastic opening act, and I'm so glad I got to see Issues live. While I do think Bring Me the Horizon needs better setlists, I understand it's just not possible. So I can't knock them. 83. Motionless and White, The Amity Affliction, Miss May I, and William Control. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, October 3rd, 2017, with Matt C. If you can't tell, I love metalcore, me metalcore music, but as you are reading this list, you will realize that most, or maybe even all the metalcore only shows are on the back half of this. As much as I love metalcore music, I always felt it was harder to get into in a live setting as compared to a lot of other genres I listen to. On the flip side, it's higher than rap and EDM in that aspect. This show is insanity on paper. The first three acts are acts I listen to a lot and they all delivered during the show as well. I was not a fan of William Control's set. The rest of it was really good. I felt like for a 2017 Motionless and White show, the set list was good as well. Something that is always a worry. With 82. Metro Station, Assuming We Survive, Abbey and Row, Lansifer, Avoid, and Rucker. Studio 7, Seattle, Washington, September 23rd, 2017. One of the biggest issues holding this show back from being higher on the list is having a six-band lineup while it not being a festival. This means when you go to a concert by yourself like I did for this concert, you are stuck in the same spot for around six hours. I feel like this, I feel like I remember not being impressed by the first four opening acts. But I also don't remember them too much outside of Lance for who just plain weird. Assuming we survive, put on a good show to get us warmed up for the main course. Metro Station was touring for the 10 year anniversary of their debut self titled album, and it's one of my favorite albums of all time. They advertised the concert as playing the entire album in full, but their set list excluded one song from the album, which definitely grinded my gears. Outside of all the facts listed above, Metro Station sounded absolutely amazing. The set list was overall great, with most of the songs from their classic debut album and some singles from the latest album. Definitely a good time.
81. Knuckle Puck, Hot Mulligan, Meet Me at the Altar, and Anxious. The Crocodile, Seattle, Washington, February 19th, 2022, with David. Show was insane, most crazy crowd I've seen in a while. I got so much of a physical workout during this show. The best part about it was all four bands sounded amazing. It's rare that you super enjoy two opening acts that you've never listening, listened to before. Definitely going to start listening to Meet Me at the Altar in Anxious. This was my fifth time seeing Knuckle Puck, and it was a bit weird because their drummer broke their hand, so the bass player played drums, and Joe played bass while he sung. So the set list was cut a bit short. They had to play songs only the four of them could play on their new instrument. But it was still an insane set. I saw Hop Mulligan for the first time, and I've been a crazy fan of them. So I was hyped to see them and see OG Blue Sky play live. 80. Halsey and Laney. Livewire Scottsdale AZ, October 1st, 2015. At the time, I didn't know who Laney was, but this show definitely made me a fan of them. Their music was catchy and the lyrics spoke to me. I even bought a shirt of theirs at the show. That's how much I liked it. Seeing Halsey before she blew up and started playing arenas was incredible. The set list was fantastic that included all my favorites at the time, and her stage presence, vocals, and production were great. It's also one of the few concerts I actually befriended strangers. 79. Architects, Stick to Your Guns, and Counterpart. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, March 2nd, 2018. Getting harder and harder to rank these concerts. I've been to so many good shows over the years that it really gets me thinking what show is better than what. This is a show where I mainly went for Architects, but was also aware of both the opening bands and was into Counterparts. Counterparts and Stick to Your Guns put on a solid opening act, and it was great to headbang along to them. It was a blessing that I got to see Architects because I was unsure if they were going to tour or even continue as a band after the death of their guitarist. Despite the absence of their, of their main guitarist, may he rest in peace, Architects were able to put on a great show. The sound list was good and the energy and vocals were on point. 78. Mayday Parade, State Champs, Just Friends, and Mom Jean. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, July 31st, 2019. This was my eighth time, eighth time seeing State Champs, fourth time seeing Mayday Parade, and first time seeing Mom Jean, who I also really enjoy. All three bands put on a great set list. Pretty standard, enjoyable pop punk show. 77. Sleeping with Sirens, State Champs, Tonight Alive, Water Parks. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, December 1st, 2016. The only negative to the show was that the audio quality could have been better. The lineup itself was incredible and a very odd one at that, but I guess it made sense because this was Sleeping with Siren, Sirens touring for Madness, which was softer by nature. Despite being a tour for Madness, which I actually enjoyed, the set list was still a good set list, which I'm sure a lot of people weren't worried about. Being a fan of Sleeping with Sirens, State Champs, and Water Parks, this lineup excited me deeply. I managed to get front stage for the show, which made it even more epic. Water Parks, State Champs, and Sleeping the Sirens were all on point with great charisma, vocals, instrumentation, set lists, and crowd interaction. 76. One Republic and Fitz, Fitz and the Tantrums. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, August 22nd, 2017. A lot of the remaining shows being ranked will be influenced by how much I like an artist compared to the others. as only as natural in the ranking line. The remaining shows were all stellar in the live department of the headliner. I vaguely remember this show in particular being a last minute decision. Could be wrong about that, but it was a decision I'm glad I made. Not being a huge fan of Fits in the Tantrums, they quite surprised me live, and I walked away liking more songs by them than I did beforehand. One Republic was essentially doing a greatest hits, whatever we want to play to her, which I admire a lot because that makes. because that makes. It, so it's not overloaded the set list with one album, which is something I hate when artists do. The set list was good, the atmosphere and weather were good, and the live performance was rock solid. 75. Some 41 senses fail and as it is. Neptune Theater, Seattle, Washington, October 19th, 2016. Some 41 was my, one of my favorite bands growing up. They were back for the first time in six years with a brand new album, and they came to Seattle to support. Well, I think the album 13 Vices 
wasn't as good as their previous efforts. It wasn't bad by any means. If I remember correctly, this was one of those sets where the new album was overloaded on the set list. That was my only drawback to the show. As It Is was one of my new favorite bands at the time, and I rocked out hard to them. I was one of the few people in the crowd who knew the lyrics to their songs, and Patty Walters actually pointed at me during the set. Getting to see a full Sum 41 headline set for the first time ever was an incredible experience, and I was also front row for the entire show. 74, Keen. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, March 7th, 2020. It was absolutely incredible. They played a two-hour set, and I was blown away by that fact alone, but the set list was well-crafted, and an old boy can talk and sing live. His voice is powerful and incredible. I'm happy I finally got to see them. It also had me thinking about the time I discovered King. Way back in the day, I had no idea who they were. My piano teacher wanted me to learn somewhere only we know. But then she decided it was too hard for me at the time. I absolutely loved the song when I heard it, however, and became an instant fan. I'm glad they're back touring and making music again, and it is a night I will never forget with great people. I met three people at the show who I ended up spending my night with. Being able to talk to people for seven hours instead of hanging by myself makes the concert so much better. Great conversations with great people, and I hope to run into them at more shows in. 73. Mesa Meltdown Night One. Shine Down, Breaking Benjamin, and Nothing More. Mesa Amphitheater, Mesa, Arizona, October 21st, 2015. This was my second time seeing Shine Down and my first time seeing Breaking Benjamin and Nothing More. Nothing More started off with a good set. I was relatively unfamiliar with their music, but boy, do they have talent live. Growing up a massive Breaking Benjamin fan, I was finally excited to get my chance to see them, and they did not disappoint. The stylus, the vocals, the charisma, the instrumentation, and the production were all on point. I was front row for this entire show, so seeing them up close and personal was a treat. Shinedown came on and tore the place up. Being a fan of Shinedown, but not an artist I listened to as regular as others, I was impressed at their set. Having this being the second time I had seen them, it was easy to compare between the first time I saw them, and honestly, the first time I saw them was better. But there's an important reason for that, which I will get to later. 72. Five Seconds of Summer in Hay Byron. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, August 28, 2016. Hay Violet was surprisingly good opening act that led the way for a really great Five Seconds of Summer set. The show was special because I got to the venue and was off, and they offered me an upgraded seat for only $10, which is way cheaper than it would have been to buy the same seat outright in the first place. I had 100 level seats now, and it was a great view. The set list was solid, and the performance was top notch. 71. Yellow Card and Sean O'Donnell. The Marquee, Tempe, Arizona, March 2nd, 2017, with Lester, Matt AZ, and Alyssa. A two hour set of Yellow Card on their final tour ever with Great Friends. Tell me in. Yellow Card had to reschedule the original date of the show, and in turn, the show got a different set list than the normal tour because they wanted to play what they wanted to play for their few final shows. I don't blame them, but the rest of the tour got Ocean Avenue in full, I believe. And this show would definitely be higher if we'd gotten that set list. Overall, it was a great show with a jam packed two hours. Of good song after good song, great crowd interaction, and a great way to send off yellow card. 70. Here's the Veil, Falling in Reverse, and Crown the Empire. The Knitting Factory, Spokane, Washington, February 18th, 2017, with Matt C. Driving five hours to see this show was worth it. I was mainly there for Pierce the Veil, while my friend was mainly there for Falling in Reverse. It was the best of both worlds tour for us. The venue was actually pretty good, and the journey in general was great. Because we got to visit the mall in the area, eat some good food, and enjoy an area we weren't too familiar with. Crown the Empire sounded really good live, which was a worry after a lineup changes had recently occurred. Falling in Reverse was better than I expected because I wasn't expecting much, and I walked away from their set a fan of a couple songs that were played. Despite being a misadventurous air of Pierce the Veil, the set list was overall good and the live show was incredible. They even played Stay Away from My Friends, which 69. Warp Tour Stop 1. Our Last Night, Counterparts, Courage My Love, Boston Manor, Dance Cabin Dance, Futuristic, Memphis Mayfire, Movements, CKY, American Authors, Goldfinger, Neck Deep, and Bless the Fall. Century Link Field, Seattle, Washington, June 16, 2017. Admittedly, it's hard to rank festivals in with normal concerts 
but I don't want to exclude them from the list. The lineup for 2017 Warp Tour was the weakest of all the years I went. I actually went to two stops of Warp Tour in 2017. Now, the second stop, I had a friend with me, which made it better by default. The lineup of bands I saw above includes a mix of artists I regularly listen to and some I don't listen to at all. It was the only Warp Tour where I had to fill my day with bands I don't listen to. Despite that, it was a good day with lots of cool performances, and my favorite picture I've ever taken comes from our last night set at this show. 68. Imagine Dragons, Atlas Genius, and Vox Nora. Marquee Theater, Tempe AZ, February 8, 2013, with McKenzie. This list. Ah, never mind. Imagine Dragons were the headliners at the show, and it was promoting their first album back when Imagine Dragons was still a good band. This was one of the few shows where I left a fan of an opening act and kept actively listening to the opening act. Atlas Genius was that act. I knew nothing about Atlas Genius, but they surprised me more than any other unknown opening act I had ever seen before. That still might be true to this very day. After Atlas Genius, Atlas Genius blew me away, Imagine Dragons came with a great setlist, great production, and a good live stage presence. The only drawback to this concert was the rude people next to me. 67. Sean Mendes, Climate Pledge Arena, Seattle, Washington, June 28, 2022. Sean Mendes put on an incredible show. You can see his vocal talent showcased very well when he performs. He's just as good live as he is in the studio. I would have tweaked the set list a bit, but still an amazing show. Definitely worth seeing if you ever get a chance. 66. Ariana Grande, Rixton, and Cashman. U.S. Airways Center, Phoenix, Arizona, April 6, 2014. You ever think you will feel out of place at a concert, but you end up not feeling that way because you end up sitting next to someone that was actually your age? I was amazed how this actually happened. If I recall correctly, this show was supporting her second album, which means there were zero bad songs in the set list. The best part about this show is definitely the production. The more famous the artist is, the better production gets in most cases, and this was no exception. Ariana's voice is even better live than the studio versions of her songs. Say what you want about her music, but Ariana has some serious chops. The opening acts to the show were average, which I often expect to be the case at pop shows. So this show was completely carried by Ariana Grande, and she delivered. 65. Link-182, a day to remember, the All-American Reject. The Arena, Seattle, Washington, September 17th, 2016, with Tara. Seeing two bands I grew up listening to constantly. Success. Seeing my favorite band ever? Well, not quite. Ranking this concert is hard because I couldn't get myself to put it further back on the list because the opening lineup was stacked. I have been listening to both A Day to Remember and All American Rejects since 2005 when I started listening to secular music. Both bands have gone me through a lot of tough times and even though I never expected to be played live, You Had Me At a Low by A Day to Remember is my second favorite song of all time. It was a dream to get to see both bands. Both bands sounded fantastic live, knew how to hype up a crowd despite performing pop punk metalcore to an arena audience and both bands had great set lists. Now let's get to why the show isn't higher. A day to remember that All American Rejects carried this concert to such a high ranking in the first. Blink-182 is my favorite band of all time. Wait, not just any Blink-182, but the real Blink-182. That's right. Blink-182 with Thomas Matthew DeLong is my favorite band of all time. Sadly, I never got to see this. Uh, well, I guess at the time of writing this, that has since changed. Um, Yeah, so, first off, as a Blink-182 fan, I can admit that they aren't the best live band. With Tom, they aren't even that good of a live band anymore, but with Matt, they are far worse live than with Tom. The fact that I had to sit through obvious and bad Matt live vocals and spotted guitar attempts, as well as sit through Songs from California, an album I have still not listened to, as well as the Blink-182 Ignore Neighborhoods, my second favorite album from them, Brought the show down from what could have been the best show I'd ever seen to this here forty to this here spot being carried by the opening act. The only reason I went is because the opening act lineup was so stacked and they were two artists I really wanted to see. It was cool to finally cross Blink 182 off my scene list, even if it wasn't the real blink. 64. Free throw equipment can't swim in early humans. Pub Station, Seattle, Washington, March 18, 2023. 
That was the wildest show I've been to in a minute. From getting bounced around to getting accidentally hit in the head, the pit was absolutely wild, even though I was just right outside of it. The first two bands I had never heard of before, but I became a fan of equipment real fast. It sounded absolutely incredible. Can't Swim was next. The Can't Swim crowd was bonkers. I was basically barricaded with one more person in front of me, and the crowd behind me was so wild it became chaotic. I was there for free throw, and they put on an amazing show, although it was easy and necessary to get distracted by the mosh pit to make sure no one got seriously hurt. I had never been to this venue before, which was called Substation, and I was greatly impressed with the venue aside from the security guard. 63. Boston Manor, Trash Boat, Anxious, and Higher Power. Elcor Zone, Seattle, Washington, April 28, 2022. I got to see Boston Manor and Trash Boat, two bands I really like. And let me tell you, they both rocked it. The energy was insane, the performance was just as good as studio, and the crowd vibes were incredible. One thing I especially loved about this Boston Manor set is their set list. I saw them back in November of 2021, and although, and tonight, or today. Yeah. I saw them back in November of 2021, and both set lists were drastically different from each other, which was a good thing. That meant that in the span of a few months, I got to see a lot more variety of Boston Manor songs than I would have if they decided to play all the same songs. Incredible set list, incredible show. Both Trash Boat and Boston Manor were amazing to see live again. Psalm 41 and Simple Play. Go Box Soto, Seattle, Washington, August 13th, 2022. The Settlers were some of the best shows in Settlers I've ever seen. One really good thing about these bands is no matter what songs they choose to play, they both sound incredible for every song. Some 41 played a set list full of their classic songs and nothing else, which is not something I expected, but it was amazing. Incredible night. 61. Julian Baker and Dead. The Moore Theater, Seattle, Washington, November 10th, 2021. No Julian Baker show will ever be a week show. No matter what her set list is, she plays incredible and sounds amazing every single time. The show was a good combination of classics and new songs. There was only one opening act, which I found out that unless it's a scene show, is a good thing. 60. Rockstar Disrupt Festival 2019. Some 41, Autry Youth, The Youth, Sleeping with Sirens, Thrice, Circus Survive, Memphis Bay Fire, Four Years Strong, Pyro the Hero, Juliet Sims, and Andy Black. It was an absolute blast. Rockstar always puts together good lineups, and this was no exception. There were 11 bands on the bill, and I was excited to see 8 of the 11, which is pretty high. It was special for a lot of reasons. I got to see the youth play I Caught Fire, which is a song that the lyrics relate to me a lot, and also might be one of my favorite songs of all time. Two, I got to see Memphis Mayfire and Thrice play songs with Jesus Christ-centered lyrics to a secular crowd. I got to see Sleeping With Sirens play their new, two new songs, and it was great hearing Helen scream on stage. This was my third time seeing them. I got to see Sum 41 play an old school centric set list. Also got to see Sum 41 for the third time, and they are one of my favorite bands, so I was extra excited for them. I got to see Andy Black play We Don't Have to Dance, which is a song I surprisingly enjoy a lot. After two failed attempts to see Circus survive in the past, I finally got to see them for the first time. I got to see Four Years Strong and Audrey Yu for the second time each, and they put together an amazing set list. It was great to do nothing all day except rock out. I managed to get a great seat and somehow managed to get out of the White River parking lot in five minutes. That never happened. 59. Kina Granis and Imaginary Future. New York, Seattle, Washington, July 18, 2018. With Leanna. This is one of the few times I have seen an acoustic artist live and let me tell you that outside factors can cause a show to go down the list. People were being crazy noisy during Imaginary Future which was mad annoying. Thankfully for the headliner Kina Granis it was okay for the most part. Kina is one of my favorite female artists ever and this was the first time she has come to Seattle or even toured the US since I became a fan of her back in 2014. I knew I had to go to this show because I wasn't sure if I would ever get another chance to see her and I wasn't disappointed. Her vocal talent is insane. She interacts with the crowd well, and she has good stage presence for just being a single person on stage. My only complaint was that the set list could have been better, but it's easy for me to nit nitpick set lists. Having a friend with me definitely helped the experience. 58. State Champs Against the Current with Confidence and Don Broker. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, April 17, 2017. The show would have been higher, but I was sick at it. 0 out of 10. I'm surprised I put this show so high because I was sick at it. 
The reason for this ranking is because the show itself was incredible, even though I felt miserable. First off, the lineup was absolutely stacked. With three bands I really enjoy on the lineup, and a band that I think has talent, the lineup couldn't go around. State Champs is one of my one of the few bands for me that is a must see every single time they come in town. At the time I'd seen State Champs seven times and had a plan to see them an eighth time this summer. They're tied with real friends for band that I've seen the most times. Sickness was not going to keep me away from this concert. One of my favorite parts about this concert was when the lineup was announced and I'd never heard of Don Broca before. I actually decided to go look them up ahead of time, which is something I don't find myself doing too often. But for some reason, I did this time. I ended up really loving what I heard from them and was even more stoked for the concert. When the show arrived, arrived all four bands put on great sets, but especially Don Broca and State Champs. They were my two favorite bands on the lineup. Both had great set lists and... On top of very good stage presence and sounded better than the studio versions of themselves. After the show, I bought Don Broco's CD and even got it signed by some of the members. I've let sickness get in the way of concerts before, but I'm ha happy I didn't let it happen this time. State Champs, Neck Deep, Knuckle Puck, and Like Pacific. Denial, Mesa, Arizona, February 27th, 2016 with Matt AZ. Back-to-back -back State Champs shows on the list. Surprisingly, far as stack line... For, for as stacked as this lineup was, the show doesn't stick out to me in such a way to push it over other shows ahead of it. This lineup is basically four of my favorite modern pop punk bands back when Knuckle Puck and Light Pacific were still good. It was a co-headlining tour between State Champs and Neck Deep, which means each band played around an hour. And I actually really like that because both bands are deserving more than a 45-minute set list. I believe this tour was state champs supporting all around the world and back again, that it was about to come out soon. I know some people have different opinions about that album, but I love it a lot personally. The set list for all four bands were jam-packed with good songs, and I was impressed with how well put together each set list was. I remember rocking out harder than I usually do when Neck Deep and State Champs came on, and this was actually my first time seeing all four bands, I believe. It was great to knock them all off the list. The show was a game changer for me because I have now seen State Champs seven times, Neck Deep five times, would have been six, but I got sick around. I got sick and skipped one of their shows in Knuckle Puck four times. I believe that's even higher now. I believe State Champs is eight times and Knuckle Puck is like five times or something like that. I must have five or six times. I must have wrote this a while ago. Uh, Anyway, 56, Augustana and Scars on 45, Crescent Ballroom, Phoenix, oh wait, I just realized. I, how far, how long have I not been clicking? Uh. Definitely not Augustana, though. Yeah, I haven't been clicking for a minute, I don't think. Oh, wait. Never mind. Uh, dang it. I messed up. I messed up somewhere. Uh, let me hold on. Let me fix this. Where? Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay, here's the Kina Granite. Um, hold on. How do I fix this? Okay.
No. Oh, I guess I can go backwards, right? Or is that gonna keep going forwards? That's keep going forwards. Dang it. Um. Ah. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this was Kina Granis. Then here was State Champs. And then here were state champs again. Okay. So now, 56. Augustana and Scars on 45. Crescent Ballroom, Phoenix, Arizona, December 4th, 2014. The Astros. I've been a huge fan of Augustana ever since my friend Ann got me back to them. Got me into them back in high school. My best friend Ashley is even a bigger fan of them than I am. This was a dream come true to get to see them together. The show was... So good and spending time with my friend was so good that I forgot to take pictures of his show and it might be the only official concert I've ever forgotten to at least take one photo of. Stars on 45 was an unknown band to me but I left a huge fan of their song Crazy For You. That song has since been relevant in my life multiple times and I just really enjoy a good well written sounding love song. We were front row for the show and I couldn't be happier because August Tunnel put on an incredible show. Fantastic set, great live vocals and instrumentation, and a great crowd with a friend. Warp Tour Stop 2. Oh, this is number 55. Warp Tour Stop 2. Memphis Mayfire, Neck Deep, Being as an Ocean, CKY, Goldfinger, Andy Black, Boston Manor, Silverstein, Our Last Night, Guar, Dance Gavin Dance, I Prevail, Oregon State Fairgrounds, Salem, Oregon, June 17, 2017, with Matt C. This show ended up more spots away from Stop 1 of Warp 2017 than I thought it would have. I think this goes to show that the power of having a friend at a concert is real. A lot of the bands between Stop 1 and 2 were the same to me because I thought the 2017 lineup was the weakest as compared to other years I went and didn't really feel like I missed out on anyone I really wanted to see at Stop 1, which led to a lot of repeating artists or seeing some artists that my friend wanted to see. The venue felt nicer at Soft 2, and road tripping with my best friend was incredible. It's hard to describe Warped because of how many bands you see in a day, but the show was solid show from start to finish other than me getting sunburned. 54. The Spill Canvas, Wild, Super Whatever, Moments, and Hampton. Chop Suey, Seattle, Washington, December 11, 2017. The show was super cool because I ended up really enjoying the opening acts, Moments and Super Whatever, both who I'd never heard of before. The four opening acts combined out in a great show, and this probably would have been higher had I known about them beforehand. It was a dream to finally get to see the school canvas, and I had been listening to them since junior high. This tour was in support of their 10th anniversary of... Um, what? That doesn't seem right. Well... This tour was in support of one of their albums, uh, which was cool to me. They played an encore of only two songs from different albums, which was sad that I didn't get to hear my favorite song from the band, but I wasn't sweating it that much. The lead singer absolutely crushed it, and the stage presence by the band was incredible. Fifty-three. Emory, Duke Evers, and Wall of Bears. New of Seattle, Washington, July eleventh, twenty seventeen. Him and Son. The show managed to climb so high, large in part of the fact that VFP was only thirty dollars for this tour. I got to meet a band, take a picture of the band, hear acoustic acoustic songs, participate in a Q and A with really great friends. It was the first time I'd ever gotten VIP for a band, and the experience was wonderful. Sellers and energy of the concert was fantastic too. Fifty-two, My Chemical Romance, Taking Back Sunday, and Kimia Dawson. Tacoma Dome, Tacoma, Washington, October third, twenty twenty-two, with Matt C. This was my first time seeing My Chemical Romance, and, and my second time seeing Taking Back Sunday. I think a lot of why this concert ranks so highly is just the fact that I finally got to see My Chemical Romance 
but I didn't think that would ever be possible. It sounded incredible live and had a great set list. Now we move on to The Great. At 51, Kenny Chesney and Old Dominion. Sleep Train Amphitheater, Chula Vista, California, August 4th, 2016 with Matt C. I wasn't sure where this concert would end up being the worst of the Kenny Chesney shows I've seen, but it finally found its home. I don't have too much to say about the show other than Kenny Chesney is a literal madman on stage. So much energy, so much talent, brilliant stage setup and production, and an absolute shredder. My major complaint with the show is how the set list wise, it feels like once you have seen one Kenny Chesney show, you have seen them all. 50. Mariana's Trench and Mainland, The Marquee, Tempe, Arizona, January 17, 2016. What made this show so special was that according to Mariana's Trench themselves, it was their first time playing in Arizona, so they did something incredible. A free meet and greet after the show. I believe I had pictures with three of the band members, or maybe even the whole band. It was incredible getting to meet the band that has been one of my absolute favorites since 2007. Master Breach Theater is one of my favorite albums of all time, and I finally got to see Mariana's Trench live, and it was a dream come true. I like the vast majority of Mariana Trench songs, so the set list was great, and the live performance was stellar. Josh Ramsey has one of the most talented voices and vocal ranges I've ever heard, and it's even more incredible live. I also remember enjoying the opening band, Mainline. 49. Beartooth, Every Time I Die, Fit for a King, and Old Wound. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, October 8, 2016. I don't have too much to say about this show, but I will say that it was one of the craziest shows I have ever been to. I was on the floor for the show, and from the front of the floor to the back of the floor in every area to the left and the right, the crowd was going absolutely insane. 48. The Spill Canvas, Have Patience, Corey Wells, and the Juliana Theory. El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, November 6, 2019. Spill Canvas had an absolutely amazing set. They were playing a 15-year tour as a band, and they played most of their first album, plus select other songs. It was a really great set list, and the energy was phenomenal. Glad I got to see them again. I finally got to see the Tide live since they didn't play it last time, but honestly, they turned an acoustic song into a rock song, and it did not sound like the Tide, which is one of my all-time favorite songs. I'm still happy, though, and the set list was great, but hopefully this is the last time Ever, I will go to El Corazon. I'm tired of this place. Also, I want to shout out all of the opening acts because for the first time since probably 2017, I enjoyed all the opening acts at a show that had three plus openers. These artists were Hat Patience, Corey Wells, and the Juliana Theory. I've seen Hat Patience twice before, back when they were named Moments, and I had heard the name Juliana Theory, but didn't know they were famous for having their songs appear in Disney movies. So I'd probably heard their music before without knowing it. 47. Pierce the Veil, Neck Deep, and I Prevail. Pillbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, September 6, 2016. While I'm not a big I Prevail fan, I can definitely still say this lineup was stacked. I Prevail has become a headliner band in the metalcore scene today, so seeing them when they were on the rise is something cool I will always get to say. Neck Deep was touring in support of Life's Not Out to Get You, but decided to switch the set list up quite a bit from when I saw them headline for the same album. Ben Barlow came on stage and said they were playing songs from the album that didn't get played previously. And I think that is really cool because if you go to a lot of shows by the same artist, it gives you more variety, more of a reason to see that artist again. The stage presence of Neck Deep was another top factor. And while Ben's live vocal performance are debatable as to the quality, I thought they sounded great overall. This is my first time seeing Pierce the Veil, and it always makes me sad that I didn't get to see Pierce the Veil during their Fly with the Sky era, because the setlist from that era would have been absolutely incredible for me to see. The setlist was overall good. Pierce the Veil was supporting their newest album, Misadventures, which I fully believe is their weakest album to date. Well, now their second weakest album to date. By a decent margin, but there are a few songs I absolutely love from that album. If I remember correctly, they played them all, so I still enjoyed the setlist, and I think they get it did a good job in mixing old songs and new songs. Songs from Misadventures also sound better live than the album itself. The, the best part of the show was for the fact, I believe, for the first time ever, they decided to put Kissing and Cars on their tour set list. Why is it so incredible? First off, Kissing and Cars is a bonus track from their second album. The fact that it was a bonus track and from an album from two cycles ago makes it incredible that they decided to play it. The second reason why it's incredible, Kissing and Cars is not only my favorite Pierce the Veil song, but also my third favorite song of all time, and it'll, 
It is also a song I never expected to get to hear live. That alone makes a show out of this world. 46. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Trombone, Shorty, and Jack Irons. The Arena, Seattle, Washington, March 17, 2007. The show was a weird one to place because I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to Red Hot Chili Peppers if I placed them too low. Red Hot Chili Peppers is one of my favorite bands, and I was happy I finally got to see them, although I'm not sure the ticket prices were worth it. It was way up high in the rafters, and it still cost an arm to attend. Other than that, the actual show was great. The opening acts were cool, but Red Hot Chili Peppers stole the show. With a great set list and production, the show couldn't go wrong. The thing I admire the most about Red Hot Chili Peppers is how old they are, and it still can rock a show like no other. 45. 1975 Pale Waves and Colors. Walmart Theater, Seattle, Washington, April 30, 2017. With Tim, Simon, and Tomas. The 1975 being one of my all-time favorite favorite bands at the time, I knew the show would be incredible. When it comes to the opening acts, I had no idea who either band was at the time, but fast forward a year later, and I became a Pale Waves fan. The 1975 had a really cool stage design. It sounded as good as the studio versions like. The tour was in support of their second album, I Like It When You Sleep, For You Are So Beautiful Yet Unaware of It. And there are a few songs on that album that I did not enjoy, so I think the set list was good. I don't think it was great. Other than setless complaints, I just wish I was taller so I could see better. But it was a great time to hear Maddie's outstanding vocals. 44. The Dangerous Summer, Arms Akimbo, and The Broken. The High Dive, Seattle, Washington, November 5th, 2019. I saw The Dangerous Summer for the third time and they absolutely destroyed it. It was one of my it was my first time seeing them as a headliner, and it was great finally seeing them play a full set. They played Reach for the Sun in Full. Then songs from their new album, Mother Nature, and it was absolutely insane. Super glad I went to the show. I want to I want to also shout out one of the opening bands, The Broken, who just got a new fan. 43. Moose Blood, Trophy Eyes, Boston Manor, and A Will Away. The Crocodile, Seattle, Washington, March 27, 2017. When I look at the show, I see it and wonder why the show isn't high on this list. This is how stacked the rest of the concerts are getting. First off, the lineup is absolutely stacked. All four bands are good bands, with three of them being some of my favorite modern bands. I believe this was my first time seeing Moose Blood live, and po possibly Trophy Eyes, Boston Manor as well. And the fact that I got to see them all at the same show just blows my mind. All three bands had an incredible set list and had super high energy throughout the show. They sounded just as good as their studio versions and had good crowd interaction. I was front row for the show, which made it even better. 42. Amy Shark and Tyler Hilton. Wonder Ballroom, Portland, Oregon, September 23rd, 2018. It's getting so hard to rank these concerts now. So many good shows left. Amy Shark was my second favorite new artist, Discovery of 2018, and I have Mark Hoppus of Blink-182 to thank for that. When their collab of Psycho was announced, it not only got me listening to this song, but also the entire album. I was very impressed with the quality of the album. So impressed that I brought tickets to see her live, even though I'd only been a fan for a couple of months. I had to drive to Portland as I had another show in Seattle the same day as her Seattle, Seattle show, but I'm not even mad. I got to explore a mall in town beforehand, and it was a great experience. It ended up being a sunny day, walking around felt nice, and I had adequate time to get to the venue and get in line. I ended up being front row for the show, which helped the experience drastically. Her setlist was amazing. She played all my favorite songs of hers, and she was very down to earth, and and had very good interaction with the crowd. She even covered "Teenage Dirtbag" by Weedis, so that was a treat. Forty-one, Julian Baker, Half Wave, and Adam Torres, The Neptune, Seattle, Washington, December eighth, two thousand seventeen. When I come to the show, I do not remember much about the opening acts, but seeing the amazing Julian Baker get this show a spot this high up. Julian Baker was on the rise, and I believe she was supporting her first album, Sprained Ankle, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. When it comes to the style of music she makes, it doesn't mesh well with stage production and stage presence, so I can't hold it against her. All this show sticks out to me so much because of the emotion she shows on stage, and you can genuinely feel the emotion. She also sounds better in person than her studio. Her stylist was perfect, and her voice blew me away. Number 40, Ed Sheeran and James Blunt. Tacoma Dome, Tacoma, Washington, July 29, 2017. There are multiple names that you will see repeated in the top 40, and that's because of how insane some of these artists are putting on shows. 
are at putting on shows. Etrian is one of those artists who never fails to deliver. His one-man show has more energy, better production, and more shredding than most full artist production. The fact that Etrian is a master at making the sounds of his entire songs played live off of just one guitar is incredible. His guitar abilities and his voice are absolutely stunning live. That's why the show ranks so high. James Blunt was super cool to see, too, as I've been listening to James Blunt since 2006. The reason the show isn't higher is largely, largely due to the venue seats I had and the fact the rest of the shows here are just incredibly good. Number 39, Rancid, Dropkick, Murphy's, The Selector, and Kevin Seconds. Walmart Theater, Seattle, Washington, August 16th, 2017. With Tim, Simon, and Jamie. The show is honestly not one I would expect to make it this high. While I enjoy Rancid, they are not a band that is super high on my tier list of favorite bands. That being said, these bands know how to put on an insane show. This show will always hold a special place in my heart because Dropkick Murphys calls people on the stage to join them for their final song and I got called onto the stage. I literally got to dance on stage with one of my favorite bands ever. My friend Tim got photo evidence of me on stage as well and will cherish those photos forever. The experience is the reason this concert ranked so high. I was also barricade for this show, I had great friends with me at the show, and Rancid Dropkick Murphys did a combined encore to Kevin where they shredded for like six songs. It was really cool how they did the encore. 38. John Bellion and Others. I don't remember the opening acts. The Paramount, Seattle, Washington, October 1st, 2017, with Tim and Simon. The opening acts were not very good, and my ears were hurting before the show even started to ruining them at the I Prevail concert. Despite this, the concert ranks so high because John Bellion put on one of the best sets I have ever seen. 37. Death Cab for Cutie and Black Belt Eagle Scout. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, February 25th, 2020. Death Cab for Cutie played Transatlanticism in full. Like what? It was random and unannounced beforehand. They just decided they wanted to play it in full tonight. I'm absolutely amazed at the show I witnessed and got to see that album in full. 36. Play Bells and Kills Birds. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, October 28, 2021. Saw Sleigh Bells absolutely destroy it. Alexis is insane live. She sounded perfect, maybe even better than studio. I was blown away by her vocals. Cellos was great. Lots of my favorites off the new album, which I was ecstatic about since I think it's their second best album after their debut. Insane show, insane setlist, and insane crowd. 35. Blink-182 with Tom. Climate Pledge Arena, Seattle, Washington, June 28, 2023. Finally got to see Blink-182 with Tom, my favorite band of all time. Unfortunately, I was dealing with post-concussion syndrome and 24-7 head pain at the time, or else the show would be higher. I, know I, I knew I couldn't miss this show no matter what, so I went anyways. The cellist and performance from Blink was absolutely incredible, and I'm happy I finally got to see Mark, Tom, and Travis all together. I just wish I could have rocked out. 34. Don Broco, Selfish Things, Sleep on It, and Trash Book. The Crocodile, Seattle, Washington, October 1st, 2019. The show was absolutely mental. Might be the most crowd service I've ever seen in one show. The entire crowd was like no other energetic when Don Broco was playing. The set list, the energy from the band and crowd, the songs being played perfectly made for a wonderful night. Being so close to the band was incredible as well. The concert was also extra great because of things I won't disclose. Might be one of the best shows I've ever been to. The opening acts, Trash Boat, Sleep On It, and Selfish Things were great as well. 33. Julian Baker, Phoebe Bridgers, and Lucy Ducas, aka Boy Genius. More Theaters, Seattle, Washington, November 24th, 2018. What can I say about this concert? It was absolutely incredible. All three of these wonderful ladies are extremely talented and write lyrics that are off the charts. Their voices are some of the best I've ever heard, and it's crazy to me how well they all work together. This tour was actually in support of their collaboration project, Boy Genius, so we got to see each artist perform a set, and then they performed their project together as the encore. The venue was great, the atmosphere was incredible, and the talent was off the charts. Julian Baker is one of my favorite solo artists ever now, which is insane to say, but her voice is so powerful and captivating. It is wonderful music to my ears. 32. The Early November, The Dangerous Summer, Diddy Bones, Safe Face, and Moments. 
El Corazon, Seattle, Washington, September 21st, 2018. The show was insane. For the first time in my life, I was the very first person in line outside the venue. That alone was something I never expected and was shocked when I got there. The lineup of this event was incredible. Moments and safe face were great opening acts, while Jetty Bone put on a good show. I was front stage for the show, and it was crazy to see two of my favorite bands up so close and personal. The Dangerous Summer has an insane set list, and the vocals were on point. The lead singer even came into the crowd to sing his last song, and it was a moment I will never forget, seeing him up close and personal in the middle of the floor. By far one of my favorite videos I have ever taken. Next was the early November, and it was my first time seeing them headline a show, so I was super stoked to see one of my all-time favorite bands. While well, I didn't play some of my favorite songs, including my favorite song by them, the setlist was still well-crafted and did a great job at showing off their whole career. They weren't on tour for a new album, so they were able to curate a setlist around that. I ended up getting the setlist for both the early November and the dangerous summer. 31. Lincoln Park, 30 Seconds to Mars, and AFI. U.S. Airways Center, Phoenix, Arizona, September 10, 2014. On paper, this concert would get number one or number two. Without Lincoln Park, this concert would be in the worst category. Let me rant before I get to why this concert ended up so high, but not as high as it should have been. Boy oh boy, am I a huge 30 Seconds to Mars fan. They have been one of my favorite bands since A Beautiful Eye came out back in 2006. They were one of the first secular bands I got heavily into, and I wish I could say that they are good live, but I can't. I'm actually surprised the show ended up this high because of how bad 30 Seconds to Mars are live. First off, Jared Leto lets the crowd sing over 50% of the words. I'm here to listen to 30 Seconds to Mars perform, not the crowd. I'm here because I love your music, even the old stuff. I'm here because A Beautiful Lie is one of my favorite rock albums of all time. So what are you going to do? Make a trash that links completely ignoring your first two albums, except an acoustic version of The Kill, not even the full version. Then your set list is completely composed of your last two albums. That alone is bad enough, but then Jared doesn't sing 50% of the time. Double yanks. Now let's get to the good. AFI provides a solid opening act, playing new songs and classics alike. It was great to finally see them and jam out some of my favorite songs. Now the reason this concert managed to make it so high, despite the faults of 30 Seconds to Mars, is because Lincoln Park put on a top 5 set I'd ever seen. Some shows are boosted by every act having a solid set, but this show is boosted solely by... Lincoln Park having an amazing set. Every time I thought about finally putting this concert on the list, I kept thinking about Lincoln Park's set being a top five set I'd ever seen and I just couldn't get myself to do it. Chester Bennington, RIP, is an absolute genius when it comes to singing, screaming, and live vocals. Lincoln Park is in my top five bands of all time, top five artists actually, of all time. And the fact that they can replicate the studio work to a T while also putting some new extended intros and outros to songs and sound perfect doing it is absolutely insane. Let's talk about the set list was absolutely insanity. They played 27 songs. 27. I've never seen so many songs played in one set list. And one of them was a medley of three songs. So they really played 30 songs. On top of this, the set list was in support of The Hunting Party, which is their heaviest album. And Lincoln Park decides to have the set list match the energy of the album. I absolutely love good heavy Lincoln Park. So when they created a mainly upbeat setlist, I was absolutely enthralled. Lincoln Park is the literal definition of how to create a setlist. They played six songs from Hybrid Theory, including non-singles With You and Run Away, and two songs from EUR, which meant eight songs from their new metal days. They also played a good variety of songs from Minutes and Midnight's Living Things and The Hunting Party. I believe A Thousand Sons had little representation, but still had some songs from it. My only complaint was that they did not play Breaking the Habit, my favorite song from the first two albums, so I will never get to see it live, but the set is so insane that I can't even complain that much. The fact that Chester was able to perform so well, such a heavy set list, amazes me to this day. I could legit see Lincoln Park's set never leaving my top five sets ever seen. 30. AJR and Tessa Violet, Paramount, Paramount Theater, Seattle, Washington, September 30th, 2019. I saw AJR and while I expected to have a fun time, I wasn't prepared for what I just went. That was probably the best stage production I've ever seen in a show. I'm currently mind blown by the stage production. Incredible show, I'm so happy I went. The set list was top notch and the actual performances of the songs were literally perfect. That plus some of the best production I've probably ever seen makes it one of the best shows I've ever seen. I can't believe I got to meet, talk to, and hug Tessa Violet. I even got a picture with her. Incredible experience. I was on cloud nine afterwards. I'm a huge Tessa Violet 
fan. And it was amazing to get to see her for the first time. 29. Kenny Chesney, Old Dominion, Dan and Shay. Lumen Field, Seattle, Washington, July 16, 2022. This is my third time seeing both Old Dominion and Dan and Shay, plus my fourth time seeing Kenny Chesney. All three acts put on a great live show, but every time I see Kenny Chesney specifically, he blows me away. Amazing vocals, incredible energy and stage presence, and another fantastic set list. Just like every Kenny Chesney performance, it ends up being one of my favorite shows ever. 28. Chelsea Cutler, Adam Melchior, Rosie. Crystal Baldwin, Portland, Oregon, April 27, 2022. The show would be way higher, but it's the second show of the tour I saw, and you will see why the other show, show ranks way higher. Chelsea Cutler is an incredible artist with an amazing set list. The middle of the night before was way better. This was still one of the best shows I've ever seen. 27. State Champs, Our Last Night, The Dangerous Summer, and Grayscale. The show box, Seattle, Washington, March 21st, 2019. I want to start off by saying these next five concerts were insanely close with each other and I kept going back and forth how to rank them. The reason this concert is so high is I mean, is mainly how stacked this lineup is. I've been listening to Our Last Night since middle school. The rest of the lineup is some of my favorite modern bands. This is a show where the whole lineup carries the concert as a lot of shows below have artists that are top 10 or top 20 to me all the time. And it is also the only show from Actually, I don't even know. First off was Grayscale, who released an insanely good debut album, and I'm excited to see where they go next. Grayscale is absolutely mental live. It sounded better than their studio selves, and it had tremendous energy. Next was The Dangerous Summer, who I was seeing for the second time in my life, and it was really cool to see them perform. It, I was back at a bar seat because you get the best view of the show that way at this venue, and no one blocks your view that way since I'm not the tallest person in the world. The lead singer, again, came out into the crowd to sing their last song, so I assume it's tradition for them to do so. It was really cool to see it happen again, even though I wasn't up close and personal to it like last time. Dangerous Summer absolutely shredded it, and I'm excited to hear their new album. Uh, I wrote that. Yeah. I wrote that year, years ago. Their new album came and went. Um, our last night fell out of place on this tour, but I, I love them, so I was all for it. With the rest of the bill being based around pop punk, uh, Our Last Night provides some metalcore for our ears. Our Last Night actually had a good chunk of softer songs or non screaming rock songs. I was expecting the set list to, to revolve around that to fit in better, but oh my, was that wrong. Every song until their last two songs in the set were melting, heavy, and definitely gave the crowd some metalcore screams to rock our ears off. The set list was amazing and the band sounded wonderful with lots of energy. Last was State Champs, who is one of my favorite modern pop punk bands. Every time they play, they have never let me down. Derek sounds really good live every time I see them. And with every new album releases, they still manage to have a solid set list and have a good variety of all their albums represented. All this on top of the fact they played at my favorite venue made for an amazing show. 26. Ed Sheeran, Snow Patrol, and Anne Marie. CenturyLink Field, Seattle, Washington, August 25th, 2018. The biggest thing from stopping this show being higher is the set list was almost exactly the same as the last time I saw them. Ashups were the same, starting songs and encore were the same, song order was basically the same, and I believe 99% of the songs were the same. That being said, Etchern is a, is a top solo artist of all time for me, and his shows are still incredible. I had seats up in the 300s for this show, but that doesn't even matter because of how powerful his performances are. His vocals are insane live, and he is a one-man show up on that stage. Essentially, everything I said about the Ed Sheeran show from 2017 reigns true here. The reason this show is quite a bit higher than that show is because he played an air C at this show and because of the opening acts. I've been a Snow Patrol fan since around 2006, and it was... Incredible to finally see them. I always find it weird when solo pop stars invite bands to open for them. It was an incredible experience. That was just great, stage was great, and performance was stellar. I had just gotten into Amory a couple of months before the show, and I am glad I did because I absolutely love her music. Her album was one of my favorites from 2018. My only complaint is that her set list included one song from her album that I didn't like, but other than that, she put on a great performance. It was one of the best opening acts I'd ever seen. Oh, what? No. What? What happened?
Oh, there we go. All right, 25. Kenny Chesney, Thomas Rhett, Old Dominion, and Brandon Lee. CenturyLink Field, Seattle, Washington, July 7th, 2018. Many in this concert get put here instead of hires because I remember the set list being almost exactly the same as the last time I saw them. The thing when artists don't keep mixing up set lists, the more you see an artist can lead you to not wanting to see them again. Kenny Chesney is my favorite solo artist of all time, and I think I've decided that I don't plan to see him again. However, I may change my mind the next time he comes to Seattle because he is incredible live. Uh, pretty sure I did see him again. Um, yeah. Despite not changing the set list much between tours, the set list was still overall good. He somehow manages to balance almost 18 albums in one set list. He ignores his 90 music, which I don't blame him for, but I guess at every time he doesn't play, she's got it all. Other than ignoring his 90s work, I have no complaints whatsoever. This was my first time seeing Thomas Rhett, and I was insanely happy to finally get to see him and hear multiple of my favorite modern country songs. Thomas Rhett sounds incredible live and knows how to ramp up a crowd. I actually... Uh, wait, what? Uh, let's, I wrote some things that don't make sense. Um, Old Dominion has appeared at every Kenny Chesney show I've seen. But I happened to miss them at one of the shows due to false advertising of Time Start. Don't listen to Old Dominion on a regular basis, but I do enjoy their music, especially the song Snapback. And Kenny Chesney must like them a lot. It was my first time seeing Brandon Lay, and I remember him being good as well. Stage layout, the production, and the music. Was Real Friends, oh, number 24. Real Friends, Boston Manor. Grayscale, eat your heart out. Numo, Seattle, Washington, October 22nd, 2018. If every Kenny Chesney, if every Kenny Chesney set sounds the same, what does a real friend set sound like? I've seen real friends seven times, if I'm remembering correctly, and every time I have seen them, that has been different. Even if the set was only a little different than the previous time, which I can't recall off the top of my head, the sets managed to feel very different every time. Real friends is my favorite modern pop punk fan. That in itself is a hipster opinion, but I love them to death. Let's start out with why this Real Friend show was so good. First was the lineup. I was unfamiliar with Eat Your Heart Out, but I absolutely adore Boston Manor and Grayscale, who were both touring in support of recently released albums that were both incredible releases. Welcome to the Neighborhood by Boston Manor was one of my favorite albums of 2018, and it was incredible to get to hear songs from it live. Boston Manor had a good mix of songs from their two albums, and they absolutely nailed every song. The new songs translate so well live. Real Friends had just released their new album Composure earlier that year and at the time it was my favorite album of 2018. I don't remember where it ended up in my year end list but I'm pretty sure it was top five if not number one still. The album was incredible and the fact that it was only 10 songs long made it easier for real friends to incorporate the new while also keeping the old. Dan is one of my favorite vocalists ever and his vocals were on point as always. 23. Girl in Red and Blake Rose. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, September 20th, 2022. First off, Girl in Red was incredible. The songs she did play were so good that I haven't rocked out that hard at a concert in forever. She even had me jumping up and down, which is something I often don't do at concerts. Her voice is perfect, possibly even better than studio. The, the backup band played phenomenally, and her energy was off the charts. The second thing I want to discuss is how short the concert was. I was really disappointed that she only played 13 songs. Definitely the shortest set list that I've ever seen from a headliner where the show was not a co-headliner. I really wish she played longer like most headliners because she was absolutely incredible. Overall, I had a blast regardless of the show being so short. 22. Taylor Swift and Charlie XCX. Century Link Field, Seattle, Washington, May 22nd, 2018. I'm surprised the show ended up so low because her set list of the show is way better than previous years. I will start with the drawbacks of the show. Charlie XGX is absolutely awful. One of the worst opening acts I've ever experienced, and I downright don't like her live or in studio. Next, Camila Cabela had to drop out of this show due to sickness. Zero out of two to start the show so far. I was up in the rafters in the 300s for the show because I wanted to save money. 
Now let's get it over. Now let's go over why this show is is so high up here. Taylor Swift is one of my favorite artists. Even though I will always complain about her sadly, she is well, that's not true. Her the air is to her with incredible settlers, but she is absolutely incredible live. A lot of times you imagine pop stars as not being able to replicate their vocals live, but Taylor Swift is honestly better live than in studio. It's incredible what she does. Her stage layout and production was great. The visuals and dancers and the props were all incredible. She even had two smaller stages in the back of the floor crowd that she played some songs on. The best part of this show was honestly hearing some unexpected songs in her set list. You know, a massive step up from her 1989 tour set list, which was likely due to complaints, she managed to better incorporate older albums, which was basically non-existent in the 1989 tour. The best parts of the show was hearing Love Story played normally instead of acoustic, piano mashup of New Year's Day and Long Live, and the acoustic version of Holy Ground, which is one of my favorite Taylor Swift songs of all time. The performance was incredible. <coughs> 21. Pain in the Grass 2016. Disturbed, Breaking Benjamin, Alter Bridge, Saint Sonia, Anthrax, Bob Evil, Switched Up Heart, and Window Pain. White River Amphitheater, Auburn, Washington, August 21st, 2016, with Matt C. The show ranks this highly largely because Disturbed Set must honestly be the best set I've ever seen in my life. Like with any festival style show, lineup, and people around you can make or break a show. The reason this show isn't higher is because the first four acts were not very noteworthy to me. But then came Anthrax and boy, was that a bad was that a bad experience. My friend left to go get food and I was saving my spot at the grass railing for him. This old dude comes up and threatens to throw me over the railing after I wouldn't give up my friend's spot for him. My friend didn't make it back until after Anthrax said because the food lines were so long. I felt uncomfortable the whole time and the dude finally left after Anthrax. To my surprise, the show still managed to make it this high. San Antonio was a treat to see as I finally got to see Adam Gontier live in person. They even played a couple of old Three Days Grace songs in their set. So that was a huge treat. I get to see my favorite... I got to see my favorite Three Days Grace songs be performed. Next was Alter Bridge, who put on a fantastic set with a good variety of songs and great energy. The real treat was the two headliners, which is why I was at the show. It was my second time seeing Breaking Benjamin, and the set felt similar, and it felt similar to the first time I saw them, but it was filled with classic songs that I love, great vocals, and great set energy. Next was Disturbed, and who quite literally blew me away. For a band with a good chunk of albums, they actually had a very good variety in their set list. Along with Linkin Park, they are one of the examples I point to when it comes to how a set list should be created. The set list was phenomenal and they played a lot of my favorites. Despite how you feel about their studio work, David Draven is an absolute star in his live performances. His vocals are absolutely incredible and even better than in studio. His vocal range live is an art and it's crazy to see how well him and the rest of the band perform with so much energy while also playing perfectly. The stage design and pyrotechnics were cool too. Number 20, Zan's Warp Tour 2016. I See Star is Four Years Strong, Somerset, Real Friends, We the Kings, Mayday Parade, Yellow Card, State Champs, The Story So Far, Crown the Empire, Entree You, Ocean's 8 Alaska, Knuckle Puck, Motionless and White, Sleeping with Sirens, and Sum 41. Qualcomm Stadium, San Diego, California, August 5th, 2016, with Matt C. It's very hard to rank Warp Tours with other concerts. Because while you get to see more bands you enjoy than a normal concert, each band only gets a 30 minute set. This warp tour was loaded in the lineup department where I had someone I wanted to see at all points during the day and even missed some of the bands I wanted to see due to conflicts, such as missing Less Than Jake. I went to this show as part of a larger vacation with my friend Matt and honestly it just made the show that much better being out for a vacation. It was actually my first time seeing a handful of bands on this list and while they were only 30 they were, they were only 30 minute sets. It was super nice to check them off the list. The venue was handled well. It was easy to get from stage to stage. It didn't feel overly clouded, crowded. And all the bands that I saw play did a great job. The only bad thing about this event was getting burnt to a crisp. Wear sunscreen, kids. My favorite of the day were some 41 state champs, Autry, sleeping in the sirens in motion with the boy. It's amazing to me how all the times I've seen state champs live, they always seem to destroy everyone else that plays that day. 
well as bring more energy in their shows than most bands. I also definitely think it's worth it to fly out to San Diego's Warp Tour just for Sum 41. Glad I've got to see one of my favorite pop punk bands of all time. Them being the last act of the stop also ended up being the best act of the day. Made it all the more worth it. Now we have the best shows. At number 19, Angels and Airwaves, The New Regime, and Charming Liars, Showbox Photo, Seattle, Washington, September 29, 2019, with Hunter. My friend Hunter and I saw Angels and Airwaves together, and wow, what a show. I can't believe I finally got to see Tom DeLong live. I can't believe I finally got to see Angels and Airwaves live. Two sentences I thought I would never say in my entire lifetime. The last time Angels and Airwaves toured before this show was about eight years ago which is before I started going to concerts, so this was my first chance to even have the opportunity to see them. The entertainment, the set list, the stage, and the instrumentation was all exceptional, and the vocals were way better than I expected. While there would be a few things I would change about the set list, it was a well-varied set list. I'm just amazed to see no secret crowds and no, and to see Love Part 1 only get two songs. It felt great to hear the classic songs from the first three albums especially because those songs have been with me for a long time and I've listened to those songs more times than I can get. I can always count on Angels and Airways music to be there no matter what mood I'm in. 18. Rise Against the Gaslight Anthem and Hot Water Music. Mesa Amphitheater, Mesa, Arizona. September 28, 2012. The next two shows have always been rated highly and together for me because of multiple reasons. The first reason was because... These two shows happened at a time when life reached its lowest point because of a tragedy two weeks prior. So it gave me events to get away from. It kept me together. The second reason is because the two concerts I got to see two of my. Oh. The second reason is between the, the two concerts, I got to see two of my all time favorite bands. The third reason is because the shows were absolutely incredible. With this Rise Against show specifically, I knew nothing about hot water music, but I was ecstatic to see the gaslight anthem in Rise Against. I got to the venue super early and basically had barricade as I was just one person behind actually touching barricade. The gaslight anthem put on an amazing set and it sounded absolutely fantastic live. It played a good variety of songs and it made me wish the set list was longer. Next was Rise Against and they made their set reveal around thematics and visuals that revolves around peace. Politics aside, I think the visuals were, were just really cool to see. The productions of the visuals being intertwined into the set, plus the stage design was really cool to see. I remember Rise Against having a very good set list, but I don't remember exactly what the set was. The show was supporting Endgame, which is my favorite Rise Against album, and back in 2012, I thought Rise Against was still on their A game, as I absolutely loved all their albums from Revelations for a Minute to Endgame, which means the set list was basically perfect for me because there's not a single song I dislike between those five albums. The show was a standing room show only, and I was at the front, and the crowd was absolutely rowdy. I remember dancing and jamming to their entire set nonstop, and the rest of the crowd doing the same. Tim's vocals were way better back in 2012. Raz Against didn't miss a single beat. Incredible night. 17. Rockstar Opera Festival, Shinedown, Godsmacked, Stain, POD, Fozzy, Deuce, Red Light King, Mindset Evolution, Ken White Red, and Uncrowd, AK Chin Pavilion, Phoenix, Arizona, September 29th, 2012. The show was like Warped Tour being a mini day festival, but with less stages and headliners. I actually got to play longer sets. This show also came at a time in my life where I needed it after a tragedy had recently happened in my life. Let's go into the negative of this show before the positive. HY is a terrible band. Nobody told the crowd that the first band on the main stage, Adelito's Way, would be playing at the same time as P.O.D., the last band on the side stage. I feel like they should not have overlapped. I like P.O.D. more myself, but I would have loved to see both bands. That is all. Now the positive. Two stages set up next to each other, alternating acts for the opening acts of the day that were placed in a good location not too far away from the main stage. And all the opening acts were enjoyable. That's not something you hear of a lot, but I enjoy every act I saw on the side stage. I was largely unfamiliar with the first four acts of the day besides maybe a song or two checked out on Spotify before the show, but all four of them put on a great live show. Next came the acts that I barely knew. Back in the day, I was actually a huge Hollywood Undead fan. No, wait. Next came the acts that I actually knew. 
Back in the day, I was actually a huge Hollywood Undead fan, and I loved Deuce's solo album after he had been kicked out of Hollywood Undead. Deuce played my two favorite songs from his album, and it was really cool to hear him live. Fozzie put on a good show that was able to get the crowd rocking. Next was P.O.D., a band that I grew up heavily listening to, even if I don't listen to them much anymore at this time, but I was still super excited to see them. It was really cool to me to see a Christian band play a secular music festival and to see the impact they could have on a secular crowd and do their best to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. It was really inspirational to see. I don't keep up with P.O.D. anymore and haven't for years, so I'm not sure they're still that way, but back in the day, it was really cool to see. After this, there was a rock star tent where I was able to get two pretty rock stars, and that was pretty cool. Free drinks are always a plus. Next came the main stage where I missed out a little way due to schedule, and was thrown straight into Awful Metal, which was H-Y. But no fear, Stain was up next, and they are the reason I came to this event. This was this event was done at an amphitheater where the normal stage is in front of a seated area and a lawn area. I went for cheap tickets, so I was all the way in the back in the lawn, but they didn't stop me from rocking out. I was rocking out hardcore to Stain. Stain has a great set list and played the songs well. My only complaint is Stain is they had zero crowd interaction the entire time. But they did what they were booked to do, put on a stellar live performance. This was my second major concert ever, so it was my first time seeing Stain, and I was impressed. Next was God's Time. And I want to be real with you. I do not remember the set at all. Last was Shinedown, and Shinedown is honestly why this concert ranks so high. I came for Stain, but also was a decent fan of Shinedown. I'm a bigger Shinedown fan now than I was back then, but that doesn't change how incredible they were. Their stage setup was out of this world. Their set list was fantastic. The vocals were absolutely on point. Everything sounded better than the studio version. The reason Shinedown was so memorable is because of what they said. Two weeks before this concert, I had gone through a negative, life-changing event. And before they played one of their songs, it might have been bullying, but I'm not positive. They spoke a message to the crowd, and that message was exactly what I needed to hear. God used Shinedown to speak to me when I needed help, when I needed to be spoken to when I was broken. God managed to use a secular band of all things to speak to me. I won't go into detail of what was said unless I can find the exact post I made about it. But I will say that it was planned for me to be there and that I was supposed to be at that concert. It's one of it's the one time in my life where I felt that way. It's the one time where I can say I was meant to be at this concert. And it's all thanks to Shine Down saying a paragraph or so of words to the crowd. It's an experience I will never forget. And I walked away from that show enjoying Shine Down set more than the band I came for. Dang. Incredible experience, incredible set, incredible talent on the stage, incredible timing for words in my life, and overall, an incredible day. Number 16, Churches in American Football. Try an Auditorium, Los Angeles, California, October 17, 2015. At the time, Churches was my favorite new act I had been into, and they were already regarded as one of my favorite bands ever. So I decided to drive five hours to California to my aunt's house, and then another two hours the next day for the show. I managed to get some friends to drive down with me who also had relatives in the area. The show was on Saturday. On the Sunday, I believe we went to the exact Sombrero's location that Blink-182 used to visit regularly and talks about in their song Josie, as well as journeying to the beach. It was a fantastic weekend, and it all happened because I wanted to see churches live so bad that I was willing to travel to them. The show itself was amazing. The venue was great. Parking situation was surprisingly good for being downtown LA. I was able to get merch where I bought both a shirt and a hat. That hat is still my favorite hat that I own to this day. American football was an opening act, which is absolutely incredible in its own right. American football are legends. And to see them back in action in front of my own eyes was a treat. I'm really happy I got to see Church's show before they fell off. At this point in time, Church's has just released their second album earlier that year. The album was absolutely incredible to me, just like their first album. In fact, they are two of my favorite albums ever. To see them perform these songs live was a treat. The energy and vocal power that Lauren Mayberry has on stage was absolutely phenomenal. The cellist was fantastic, in my opinion. My only complaint about the show was getting yelled out for rocking out and having fun, watching one of my favorite bands of all time. It was the first time I'd ever been yelled at at a concert, and to this day, it's only happened twice. I'm not surprised... One of the times came from California. Enjoy the shows you are at. You can sit at home. Regardless of that, and the, regardless of the fact that when I think about the show, that's what I always remember first. Churches was absolutely insane live, and I'm ecstatic I got to see them before their disastrous third album. 15. 
Dirk Bentley, Kip Moore, Maddie and Tay, and Kane and Smith. Sleep Train Amphitheater, Chula Vista, California, August 16th, 2015, with Matt C. These next two shows were hard, were hard to order, but after for this one to come before. On top of the staff lineups, which almost all their remaining lineups have, this lineup is insanely stacked. A country show with four acts where I not only know all four artists, but like all four of them, crazy. Kane and Smith put out an incredibly good show which with songs from his debut album and his number one hit song, Love You Like That. Maddie and Tay was actually who I was looking forward to the most. I was absolutely obsessed with them at the time. They only had an EP out at the time, but the EP was so incredible. I was excited to hear those girls live, and boy, they did a good job. It sounded better than the studio versions live, and they had fantastic energy with great guitar playing. Who knew a duo could bring so much energy to the stage? Kip Moore was actually the artist I was skeptical about when it came to live performance, because at the time I was more of a fan of his singles rather than having heard his entire album. So I was curious how much of the set I would know, and if that would impact my enjoyment. <laughs> it did not impact my enjoyment. Kim Moore was incredible and absolutely fantastic getting to hear one of my all-time favorite songs, Hey Pretty Girl, live. Last was Dirk Bentley, who is one of the best live performers I've ever seen. He had a cellist that does a great job of spanning his entire discography, and he even plays a song or two from his Bluegrass album. His live production, energy, and vocals were off the charts, and he even had a stage in the middle of the venue where he did a more intimate section, which was incredible to see. At one point, he walked around the crowd too, and I think that's really cool when artists do that. This was my first time at this venue, and I enjoyed the venue a lot. Dirks is definitely a must-see live if you have never seen him. 14. Andrew McMahon, Dashboard Confidential, and the Juliana Theory. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, September 1st, 2022. Wow, there are no words that can describe what I saw. A lot of 2022 concerts don't live up to the greatness of nostalgic concerts for me because of how poorly my body health has been these days. But wow, this concert is one of the exceptions. This might be one of the best shows I've ever seen. It was my second time seeing Dashboard Confessional, and they rocked it just as hard as the first time I saw them. The set list was great, the performance was on par, better than the studio work, and the energy was a blast. What I really want to talk about is Andrew McMahon. This was my first time seeing Andrew McMahon in any of his projects, and that might have been the single greatest set list I've ever seen. Andrew McMahon has been in three different bands with classic material where I like all three projects. I wasn't sure what to expect going into the concert as I didn't know the set list until the concert, but Andrew played material from all three bands in the wilderness, something corporate, and Jack's mannequin to create possibly the greatest set list I've ever heard of. I got to see one of my all-time favorite songs. I got to see some of my all-time favorite songs like Swim, I Woke Up in a Car, and Punk Rock Princess. That I never thought I'd get to see live. I also got to hear my favorite modern Andrew song, Celia and the Satellite. On top of the satellite being full of nothing but bangers, Andrew might have the best live presence I've ever seen an artist have. His energy was unmasked. From the piano playing to singing from the top of the piano to playing the guitar, he, he brought the party. While having that much energy, it is Intriguing to me how one can have that much energy but still sound so flawless. His live vocals blew me away. Andrew definitely has a once in a lifetime voice. I also need to give a shout out to his band called The Wilderness, who also played flawlessly all night. If I ever get a chance to see Andrew again, I definitely will. Also, I came to the show alone, but a group of three befriend befriended me and they were very chill and made the night extra special. 13. Warp Tour Chicago 2018. We the Kings, Don Broca with the main. As it is, State Champs, Motionless and White, Knuckle Puck, Real Friends, Amity Affliction, Movements, Bowling for Soup, Senses Fail, Mayday Parade, Knocked, Lo Knocked Loose, Broadside, Simple Plan, Beartooth, Crown the Empire, and Water Park. Hollywood Casino Amphitheater, Tinley Park, Illinois, July 21st, 2018. This was the last Warp Tour worldwide tour ever, and I ended up flying to Chicago for it. It was so worth it. Weather was the most bipolar weather of all time, but it was honestly bearable to during the MV affliction. I have been actively following Warped Tour lineups since 20, 2008, but sadly have only recently started going. I'm from Seattle, and for some reason Warped Tour thought it would be a good idea to make teenagers travel two to three hours to a venue way outside of actual Seattle. In 2015, I had another concert the same day as Seattle Warped, where it was actually in a reasonable location this time. 
I've only gone a few years, but those few years were definitely amazing. I'm sad I won't be able to go anymore. During the final year of the cross-country tour, I decided to skip Seattle and I decided to fly to Chicago for work. I picked Chicago because it was one of the dates Beartooth was playing and I really wanted to see them. Out of the four times I've been to work tour, this was by far the best lineup I saw. I got to see a lot of my favorite bands again, a few of my favorite bands for the first time ever, and even a band who I knew of but never listened to. I managed to see 19 bands at the show, which is a warp tour high for me. The Owl, Owly stage got pushed back 10 minutes, the Monster stage got pushed back 15 minutes, and the Journey stage got pushed back 25 minutes. This actually helped me add some bands in the day and not have to choose between Motionless and White and Knuckle Punk. I only made your original conflict of the day. I was go, go, go all day, but I wouldn't have done it any other way. The only time I had a break was waiting for state champ set as no one was playing who I cared to see. My only major complaint is that they did not have the journeys left and right stages next to each other, which is usually how more doesn't. It made it so a few sets I had to, I had to miss the last or first five minutes of the set. Other than that, no complaints. Happy I made the journey. Best moments. Moshing to real friends and knock loose when I normally don't mosh. Mayday parade covering the rock show at Blink-182 and Bowling for Soup playing the Phoenician Fur theme song. My favorite sets of the day were Beartooth, Real Friends, State Champs, Bowling for Soup, and Knock Loose. Number 12, Taste of Chaos, Dashboard Confessional, Taking Back Sunday, Sales in the Early November. Xfinity Arena, Everett, Washington, July 9, 2016. As a concert, it was one of the best shows I've ever been to. As an experience, I don't really know what to say. The lineup was stacked. I know I've said this many times that this lineup or that lineup has been one of the best lineups ever, but I really do mean it. There have been a few lineups that stand out as, wow, this is a perfect lineup, we're really close to it, and this was one of them. Rare to find a concert with four good acts. First up were the opening acts, the, earlier, the early November in Samson, who I both love a lot. I'd been listening to Samson since junior high, and I thought I would never get a chance to see them. It's still surreal that they are back and better than ever. We're here with original singer Anthony Green. While neither the early November or Sayerson played my favorite songs of them, they both destroyed the show. This is where the experience gets shaky. While I was recording a video of Sayerson playing, a worker approached me and told me that I'm not, around, not allowed to take videos. At a concert? Really? I've never been to a single venue before that enforces that rule. Never. There's a lot of hot takes in the alternative scene about phone use at concerts, and I can rant and argue all day, but I won't. Were you expecting to not take videos at a concert? This put me in a down mood, but only for a little bit. Next up was the headliners Taking Back Sunday and Dashboard Confessional. I love Taking Back Sunday a lot, and I was so stoked because it was my first time seeing them. From the get-go, they played an array of hits as well as newer material. This will be bad to say, but regardless, I told myself that I won't record Taking Back Sunday and just skip recording Dashboard. So I'm about Taking Back Sunday, Taking Back Sunday that I wished to record was surprisingly played first, so I missed a bit of it. I was thinking about it holding my phone up to my chest. Taking Back Sunday blew me away. Their set never let down a beat. They even played their new single and a new song from their upcoming album that sounded great. Next was Dashboard Confessional, who I admittedly not as big a fan of as the other three bands, but they put on an amazing show. Number 11, Kelsey Cutler and Kristen French. Crocodile, Seattle, Washington, September 20th, 2018. This was one of the best shows I had ever been to. I was right up at the front and had the perfect view. Meanwhile, the sound quality was still perfect, unlike the last time I was up front at the Crocodile. She straight destroyed the show. Her sound list was perfect too, since I think she has no bad songs and she played most of her catalog. Some of the electronic elements don't translate the best live, but it makes you appreciate the songs in a new light. So glad I decided to go and would definitely see her again. The Sonic's jersey is also a nice touch. The opening act, Christian French, put on a good set too. Number 10, Taylor Swift, Vance Joy, Shawn Mendes. CenturyLink Field, Seattle, Washington, August 8, 2015. Taylor Swift is an absolute monster live. The only negative about her shows is the set list could be better. She changed that and made her set list better. Um, I've seen her twice. At the time, I wrote this anyways, and this was the first time I saw her. This show's set list wasn't as good as the second time I saw her, but virtually everything about this show was better. Everything else about this show was better. I was on the floor, 
for the show compared to 300 rafter sheets rafter seats for the second time i saw her her vocal performance was phenomenal her stage setup was incredible and the energy was absolutely wild she blew me away she knows how to put on a show it also helps for the show i really really liked both of the opening acts i had been a fan of of both Shawn Mendes and Vance Joy before the show, and I was incredibly happy to have them on the lineup. Both put amazing shows with great set lists that included, that added to this wonderful night. Number nine, Taylor Swift, Girl in Red, and Owen. Orchestra Stadium, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, June 17th, 2023. The show was incredible. You will see why this show ranks so high later on this list. The sad part for me with this show is that Gracie Abrams wasn't an opener like she was on night one. Number eight, Mayday Parade, Real Friends, This Wildlife, As It Is. The Marquee Theater, Tempe, AZ, Arizona, November 14th, 2015. This concert rate racks so high. This concert racks up so high because of the stack lineup and how incredible every set was. First off, I'd like to say on how lucky I was able to attend the show. I was going to college in Arizona. My sister and her husband were actually in town the very weekend. And their birthday present to me was a ticket to UW versus ASU college football game, which happened to fall on the same day as the concert. Thankfully, the football game was a day game, and the concert venue was a 20-minute walk from the football stadium. So I parked in Tempe for the day near the venue and just walked places for the entire day. Thankfully, my sister and her husband had other plans after the game that didn't involve me, so I was able to go to the show. I lucked out because I would have been sad to miss this show. At the time of the show, Real Friends was one of my favorite modern bands, and this was my first time seeing them. I was excited to see them mostly, but also to see As It Is in This Wildlife, who had recently become massive fans of both bands. At the time, both As It Is in This Wildlife only had one about only had one album each out, but to this day, I still think those albums are each respective band's best album by far. So. Looking back at the show makes me even more excited because between the three opening acts, there wasn't a single song played that I disliked, which is something super rare to happen. First off, what as it is, and let me tell you that Patty Walters is one of the most energetic band members I've ever seen on stage. His energy at this was matched by no one else that I've ever seen before this concert or even after this concert. He was jumping up and down, moving around the stage constantly, engaging with the crowd and slinging the microphone around in every direction imaginable. The sound was also incredible for this concert, and especially as it is. I've never heard vocals more clear as day at a concert than this, as it is set. For the first three bands, I was very close to the front, which is, which is sometimes a give and take because the audio can be worse when you were so up close, but this wasn't the case for this show. The rest of as it is, Sounded phenomenal, and their set was one of one that I will never forget. I'm not sure if this was as it is first time touring America, but it was my first time seeing them. It was also my first time seeing This Wildlife. This Wildlife is an acoustic pop punk fan, and their debut album emulates that sound perfectly. As far as on stage performances, the vocals sounded amazing, and the guitar playing was on point. I feel like there's not much else you can say for an acoustic set. That list was phenomenal. Real Friends was next, and I feel like they played a collection of their biggest hits mainly, which definitely created the perfect set list. During the set, Dan gave a speech about music bringing people together, which was cool. Real Friends put on one of the best sets I have ever seen. They had so much energy and played their songs perfectly, and it was wonderful to finally see them live, as they are one of my all-time favorite bands. Next was Mayday Parade, and I'm only a casual Mayday Parade fan, so I decided to move my way towards the back of the venue for their set. The venue has a floor that slopes downward, and the venue wasn't sold out, so it really didn't hinder my view moving back. As I'm only a casual Mayday Parade fan, I couldn't tell you if it was a good set list or not, as I'm actually am unfamiliar with a lot of their work. This was one of the few shows that I went to for the opening acts, and you may ask why it's so high. But be, it's because of how good all the bands I came for were, and Mayday was still really good as well. Mayday Parade's performance was great. They know how to perform live, keep the crowd engaged, and the vocals were fantastic. They definitely made me more of a fan than before, even though I'm still a casual fan of them. I do listen to songs of theirs more often than before. Number seven, Real Friends, Knuckle Puck, Moose Blood, Seaway. The Showbox, Seattle, Washington, November 2nd, 2016. This concert was actually a the wonder years concert but i did not stay for the wonder 
but it was still that good of a show because of the other four bands. At this show, I saw Real Friends for the fourth time, Knuckle Puck for the third time, and Seaway for the second time, and Moose Blood for the first time. At a venue I had never been to before, which has now become my favorite venue of all time. I saw all bands that I really, really love, and the venue ended up being pretty sick. My favorite part of tonight was finally getting to see Moose Blood. Their set was fantastic beyond all belief, and I'm so glad I pushed myself to buy tickets way back when. Seaway did even better this time than the last time I saw them, and Real Friends and Knuckle Puck always kill it every single time. I would have modified Real Friends' set list a bit personally, but other than that, I have no complaints at all. Definitely one of the best shows I have ever been to. You already know from previous concerts on this list why this show is so good, because it was such a stacked lineup for me, and the bands that played blew me away yet again. It was another concert where I went for all the openers, all four openers in fact, and I ended up having to leave before the one year since they didn't come on till 11 p.m. and I had the final the next day. Usually I will stay for the headliner regardless, but I had to pass this time around. But that's how good the show was. It still makes it this high on the list without seeing a headliner. One that I'm not a fan of anyway, so leaving before the headliner probably made me enjoy this concert more than I would have if I stayed. Ha ha. Number six, Kenny Chesney, Jason Aldean, Brantley, Brantley Gilbert, and Cole Swindell. Country Link Field, Seattle, Washington, June 27th, 2015, with Matt C. First off was the stacked lineup. Old Dominion was also part of this lineup, but they started earlier than the showtime said, so my friend and I missed them. I'm a massive fan of Cole Swindell, and Kenny Chesney is my second favorite artist ever. I am a fan of Jason Aldean. I think the one thing that brings the concert uh, well, I think I think the one thing that brings this concert down a bit is I do not like Brantley Gilbert whatsoever, so that set was a massive filler set for me, and I didn't really enjoy myself. The rest of the concert was absolutely insane, however. Cole, Cole Swindell was the first act I caught, and he was one of my dream acts to see, being that he is one of my favorite modern country artists, and that his debut album, which was his only album at the time, I believe, is one of my favorite country albums of all time. That means you know the set list was fantastic. I believe he only played six songs, but that's to be expected when you solo on, on the bill in a five-act lineup. Cole Swindell really knew how to engage with the crowd, and he sang extremely well. Let's skip ahead to Jason Aldean. I, I am a fan of Jason Aldean, and when I say I'm, I mean I really love a lot of his songs, but I don't know all of his deep, deep cuts. The set list was basically a greatest hits set list, so I knew every song on the set list, and that was absolutely incredible. If I remember correctly, he played my favorite song of his, Amar Amarillo Sky, and that was amazing to hear live. Next was Kenny Chesney, and I'm a, su a mega super fan of Kenny Chesney. He was my second favorite artist of all time, and he has only one album that I dislike, which is his latest album with the Island Vibe sound. It's not my style, I don't think. On top of consistently putting out top tier music, he's an absolute monster life. The set was two hours long, full of classic songs and a few songs from his newest album at the time, which was The Big Revival. His production in the background is incredible. His guitar work and vocals are absolutely mesmerizing, and his energy is absolutely insane. This wows you with his performance, and unless you absolutely despise country music, you can't walk away from a Kenny Chisholm set not entertained. He's more than just a performer, but he's an entertainer. As far as entertainment value goes, he'd probably be second or third on my tier list. But, but I won't spoil that tier list. Number five, So What Music Festival 2016, day one. You found glory, neck deep, bayside, state champs, real friends, bless the fall, escape the fate, Miss May I, Emery, this wildlife, Seaway, Major League, The Plot in You, Capture the Crown, My Career Relocate, Get Scared, Outline in Color, and Begotten. Quick Trick Park, Grand Prairie, Texas, March 19th, 2016, with Matt Az. If it's fair to compare a full-on festival to a normal concert, so what music festival day one was one of the best concerts I've ever been to. We ended up seeing 18 bands, and 90% of the bands were good. The lineup was insane, and the venue was really nice. It was easy to get from stage to stage, and the feel of standing on a baseball field watching bands was great. Some highlights included You Found Glory bringing a fan on stage to pick their next song, and him picking My Heart Will Go On, which I covered a long time ago, Moshing the State Champs, and Real Friends performing a brand new song for the first time ever. My favorite bands of the day 
where this wildlife state chance was to fall neck deep in this maya. And real friends. Overall, great day, and I would definitely come back another year. I never did go back to that festival. But, you know, number four, Ed Sheeran and Rudimental. Shopping.com Arena, Glendale, Arizona, August 31st, 2014. Ed Sheeran is simply the best performer I've ever seen. He always has great stage props and backdrops and overall great sets. The amazing part about Ed's shows is how much energy he produces when he's just one man on stage. Even in songs that have more than just a guitar in them, he's able to create the, the sound of the song through the guitar using loops. It really makes the arena or stadium explode with energy. It's incredible watching one solo man go that hard when he simply makes only guitar driven music. He, all, he also usually is great at interacting with the crowd and this was no exception. He made us feel warm and welcome. I was on the floor for the show, up close and personal, where the other two times I saw him I was in the rafters. And I think being that close propelled the show to top over his other shows, as well as his set was being less predictable, whereas not much changed between the second and third time I saw Ed. The opening act, Rudimental, put on a good show as well. Number three, Taylor Swift, Girl in Red, and Gracie Abrams. Orchestra Stadium, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, June 16, 2023. Not sure how you can top a show like this with Taylor playing basically 3.5 hours playing all her airs. The folklore set was one of the flawless choices and getting to hear it was incredible. Finally getting to see the lover and evermore airs and of course the midnights. The performance was flawless, incredible night. It's hard to explain in words how incredible the show was. Taylor absolutely destroyed the night. It was hard to keep up singing along for 3.5 hours. Taylor sounds amazing live, always had good, has good backups, backdrops and props, and is always on point in her songs. Taylor is amazing to see live, and this tour, she's outdone herself. I'm seeing this show in Pittsburgh because the opening acts are way better than Seattle's opening acts. Girl in Red was insane. I saw Girl in Red play a 1K crowd venue last year, and this year play a 70K stadium was insane. Super proud of her growth as an artist. She had the most energy of all acts tonight and she was dancing around like crazy and rocking out while still sounding amazing the whole way. Plus, Girl in Red setless choices were absolutely incredible. She picked all the right songs and it was a pleasure to see her. Gracie Abrams was the other opener and I wish she played a different set list. Plus, I'm sad that she only got given enough time for five songs. But she still sounded amazing with all the songs she chose to play. Incredible show, best night ever. For those not following the Taylor Swift tour, she plays two surprise songs every night, and tonight she played Mr. Perfectly Fine and The Last Time. And I was ecstatic about those choices. Plus, my view was insanely good. Perfect night. Number two, Chelsea Cutler, AOK, -OK, Arden Jones. The Knitting Factory, Spokane, Washington, November 5th, 2022. First off, I'd like to say that oftentimes you go into a concert not knowing the opening act and rarely you walk away a fan of the opening act, but somehow Chelsea Cutler always knows how to pick her opening acts. Wow, Arden Jones has gained a massive new fan. Arden brought so much energy. Arden played a mix of EDM influenced songs, pop punk influenced songs, and ukulele songs. It was a good variety and he sounded great. This was my first time seeing AOK, -OK, but I've been big AOK -OK fan since 2018. There are songs I would have loved to hear that weren't played, but the set list was still good and AOK -OK sounded incredible. Outside of the really good lineup, the most incredible part of the show was of course Chelsea Cutler. This was my sixth time seeing Chelsea Cutler. Would have been my ninth time if three shows didn't get cancelled in 2020. She is now my third most seen artist ever and I expect her to eventually take the number one spot. Unfortunately, I'm probably dying soon and she won't take the number one spot anymore but you know it is what it is i will always go back to her shows one thing i love about chelsea cutler is she basically has zero bad songs no matter how i think the sellers should have or could have been it never even matters because every song she plays is a great i would have loved to hear more songs from sleeping with roses one but i'm not going to complain because the set list was still out of this world Another cool thing about Chelsea Cutler is she always improving on her live vocal performance. I first saw her in 2018 and I've seen her in four different years and she's always sounding better and better with her vocal delivery live. I think that's why two of the three times I saw her this year were 
most likely end up very high on this link. Chelsea had so much energy, great vocals, and a good crowd communication, which a lot of artists do too little or too much of. Traveled from Seattle to Spokane to see the show, and it was worth every penny, penny cent. They were also, there were also some other reasons the show was amazing. And number one, Chelsea Cutler, Adam Melchior, Rosie. Showbox Soto, Seattle, Washington, August, I mean, April 26, 2022 with Darian. Back in 2020, I had tickets to see Chelsea Cutler three different times, but all were canceled due to COVID. I was finally able to see Chelsea Cutler for her fourth time live, and it was an incredible experience. It was worth the wait. This was probably the best concert I've ever been to. Insane show. First off, I got to meet Chelsea Cutler, which is insane. Got to meet one of my all-time favorite artists and got to get a picture with her. Lately at shows, I actually got to meet people as people would come up to me and talk to me. But this time, I actually connected with the people I met and made new friends. And it was a blast hanging out with these new friends. I remember when I would go to shows alone and talk to no one, but now people see me by myself and want to be inclusive which is heartwarming since it's from random people. A concert I went to alone was made way more enjoyable because of some people who befriended me. Next, VIP with Chelsea Cutler was amazing. We got to hear two acoustic songs, got a signed photo book, and got a Q&A section, which was all amazing. Now the actual show itself. The show itself was incredible. While I wish we got more older songs, I still think the set list was incredible. But it's hard to go wrong in a set list when an artist virtually has zero bad songs. Chelsea sounded absolutely incredible and every song was a joy to hear. Chelsea definitely knows how to always entertain and has so much energy on stage. My new friends and I were also barricade, which made the experience even more. And that, my friends, is ranking every concert I've ever been to. Um, if I somehow forgot a concert, oh well, I don't think I did, but I don't know. And yeah, those are my concert. Um, I I really hope I can get better from my health issues and start going to concerts again. Uh, but I'm getting drastically worse worse daily, and I honestly don't think I'm gonna survive much longer. Um, I do actually have a ticket to see Chelsea Cutler. It's either the 14th or the 15th of this month. I will go to that concert if I'm still alive. Um, but I wanted to make this video before that concert um, because I'm getting drastically worse daily and I wanted to make sure this video came out. Um, I'm sure that concert won't rank very highly anyways just because of how bad I feel. Um, it's definitely why the Pow Few concert would have ranked way higher if I had actually felt okay. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening and watching. Peace.